Okay, so uh, let's get started here. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, welcome to day four of the marathon, as Natasha just called it. Um, uh, I, I guess I probably should apologize that we did it over four days. Um, <laughs> there's a lot of material that we wanted to cover. We kind of felt that it was a, a five hour sprint per, per day, so we would get through this. But uh, um, I know we're all feeling tired, but uh, um, We've still got a great day ahead of us, um, so looking forward to uh, our final session. Just to quickly recap on uh, yesterday, um, for those that weren't here, um, we basically completed session four, which was focusing on non-NASA Earth data processing architectures. We went to session five, where we looked at some of the um, astronomy uh, processing systems and the big, big data that they were processing and the techniques that they were using. And then we had a uh, session six where we discussed um, some of the interfaces that a mission processing system would um, interface with or systems that they would interface with and some of the driving specifications uh, around that. And then after that, we had um, a wonderful breakout or a wonderful group discussion followed by a breakout, uh, well, with a, with a breakout running in parallel. Um, so I thought we'd spend a couple minutes here. We'll have Natasha report out on the main room and Hook report out on the discussion that happened in the breakout room. Um, just before we do that, I just want to say a little bit about the agenda here. So um, the agenda that's on the website is slightly changed. We're changing it slightly from that, um, pushing things out a little bit um, to allow time for the breakout. Um, the, the reports were also um, we're also adding 15 minutes for the breaks instead it was originally 10 so it'll be a 15 minute um, breaks um, spread out through the day um, just to give us a bit more breathing space um, but we anticipate to end the day at around 4 15 um, eastern so we're talking what four hour session here so um, with some nice breaks hopefully um, I think that's all I need to announce. Um, so with that, I'm just going to pass it straight over to Natasha. Can you see my screen that says defining an MDPS? Looks great. Yeah. OK. Um, so uh, just to set the context for some of our new participants, especially from the commercial sector, and I think all of you saw this. Um, in the RFIs for which you um, responded. But the MDPS stands for a mission data processing system. And yesterday in our big breakout, we were talking about the, the clear delineation of what is within scope for an MDPS versus what is within scope for in NASA world, what we call a DAC or a data active archive center. And so I just wanna set the context for that on sort of where we circled um, around. So an MDPS um, is about properly processing the data for product generation um, with processes to determine if the products are ephemeral or what worth long-term archive. And so um, product creation could be by the public or it could be from the science team. This is not necessarily defined, especially in the context of open science. Um, in general, products could include standard NASA products. They could include on-demand generation of NASA products from NASA-approved algorithms, as we heard in the ISRO case. Um, it could be customized variants of NASA-approved algorithms, or it could be non-NASA products, as we heard from the Open Science Panel, specifically thinking about things that the maybe applied science community might be more interested in that NASA doesn't prioritize as their first level of products. So like state level product, like products over a state rather than global or, um, you know, an applications focused product. Um, recognizing that there's a non-trivial skill and resources required to generate products. So requiring someone to have that in-house um, is a barrier to um, using NASA data for product generation. And so that's why having something a little more open would be good. Um, but it's also worth recognizing that there's a non-trivial amount of user support that's required for opening up that system beyond the normal science team. And that traditionally MBPS has been very mission focused. Um, a data active archive is a long-term data archive with user services and support that ingests from an MDPS and interfaces with an analysis platform. They span many missions and they're more focused on scientific areas. 
they have been in place for many years and they have evolved over the years um, and they have processes in place for iterative improvement through time. Um, what do we do to decide when something is in an ephemeral product or actually should be archived? And we actually have a standard for that, S SPD 41, um, and that helps to, de to, to determine that. And then we also wanted to make the distinction that an analysis platform is not about product generation, but it's about what you do with a product when it gets to the end, right? So that's your histogram analysis, your development of models and things like that. Um, so I think I'm gonna hand it over to Hook and he can debrief here on the on-prem versus cloud discussion. Great, uh, good morning everyone, hope you can hear me. Um, so actually the, the breakout there was actually quite uh, polarizing. Um, there were actually very strong uh, perspectives and views, actually very enlightening views on, on both sides in terms of uh, you know those that are favoring uh, continuing moving further into the cloud versus those that are actually making a very interesting point that uh, effectively um, that high-end computing, especially in the context of on-premise high-end computing, still has a lot of legs, uh, so to speak. Uh, there are still a lot of benefits there. I think uh, much of that was centered around arguments uh, with respect to the cost, the cost of the infrastructure, the cost comparisons between, you know, what is the total cost of ownership when we are running in the cloud versus what is the total cost of ownership when we are running on, on in on-premise high-end computing specifically. Um, I think there was lots of discussion centered around the slide that uh, John Jenkins and Bob Ciotti had presented with respect to the, the cost comparison of compute and storage, uh, you know, between uh, what, what is uh, at the NASA high-end computing versus uh, cloud. Uh, specifically, the discussion centered around the 20 to 1 ratio. Um, I think the conclusion out of that was that we really need to conduct more thorough uh, uh, TCO, which stands for total cost of ownership analysis, to really get a better understanding uh, of what are the true costs. Uh, I think these are great first attempts, uh, but probably more is needed. And I think uh, Alexei had a good point too, is that what we really, really need at the end of the day was, is a, a nice, clean narrative that summarizes this more succinctly. Um, I think at the end of the day, there are still uh, you know, open aspects in, with respect to, you know, if it, if it is indeed that high-end computing is truly lower cost, there's still this open issue of, you know, the, the aspect of egressing data out of NASA's current data lake in the Amazon Oregon region. Um, so at the end of the day, I think there's still great arguments being mentioned either way. Uh, there's also development cost that was being discussed, you know, how do we optimize for development on-prem versus you know, all cloud native development? Uh, but I think we close it off with a, a really good and interesting point that uh, Bob Ciotti made. Um, you know, obviously we all know that NASA has a free and open data policy and, and obviously cloud vendors charge egress for this. And I think he raised a question about, you know, is, is, is this considered somewhat you know, anti-competitive, right? But regardless, I think uh, his point was that given that NASA has a free and open data policy, is there more that would we could do together as a, as a NASA organization to address you know the policy drivers of free and open versus you know cloud vendors uh, you know point about you know charging for egress uh, lots and lots of interesting discussions here I think that it raises a little bit more questions but but nonetheless I, nonetheless I think we've got some really good feedback. Excellent, thank you both for those outreaches. Uh, wonderful. I think it's good to hear that that and uh, be thinking about that as we move into session seven. So greetings all, I'm Luke Dahl, I'll be your uh, facilitator for session seven. Uh, again, please uh, post comments and questions into the chat. It's a great place for us to capture those and, and circle back. I wanna briefly describe um, session seven is on other big data processing system architectures. And this was a little bit different in that we, we put out a, re a request for information or RFI and distributed as widely as we could to solicit feedback from the communities on uh, five key areas uh, to support this study. And those are data processing system architectures, open science, component technologies, downstream interoperability, and other recommendations, which was a, a place to, to provide sort of a catch-all and relevant mission science data processing topics that weren't specified in, in the other areas. So the uh, steering committee received a number of RFI responses. Uh, they assessed those on 
uh, uh, overall relevancy to the purposes of this study and those that were deemed highly relevant uh, were invited to participate in this study. So uh, we are very excited to kick off these sessions today. Um, and I'd like to now just briefly introduce our first speaker. So Tyson Swetnam is a research assistant professor of geoinformatics at the University of Arizona and a co-PI of Cybers. So Tyson, take it away. All right, thank you. Um, so uh, glad to be here. Uh, I'm gonna do this presentation uh, with help from my collaborator and director of our cyber infrastructure, uh, Edwin Skidmore. And I believe our PI, Eric Lyons, is also on the call. So uh, Cybers is a cyber infrastructure for data-driven discovery. Let's see if I can get this going. Okay, so what is cyber infrastructure? Um, when I think of cyber infrastructure, the first thing that comes to mind is hardware. And that's not necessarily everything, right? So cyber infrastructure is a combination of software, the code, and, and most importantly, it's these people who provide the support and the training on how to use this. And I think this is probably the most often overlooked part of a CI. So a little history of Cybers. Um, it initiated in 2008 as the iPlant Collaborative through the NSF um, bio program. And it was set up to enable plant sciences. Um, we ran for about five years and were renewed. And uh, in 2013, we uh, transitioned to become the cyber infrastructure for all life sciences within bio. In 2016, uh, we again rebranded to represent the focus uh, more on the entire uh, science community. So we, we've called ourselves Cybers since then. And this is partly because we are enabling uh, folks from uh, geo, from earth science, or sorry, from uh, earth sciences, from ocean sciences. Um, we have folks from astronomy and even social scientists using the platform. And so um, at this point, we have about 98,000 registered users. And um, our mission is to design, deploy, and expand a national cyber infrastructure for life sciences. And again, this focus on training scientists in its use. Uh, part of our, our goal and objectives, um, this 2017 survey from our partners at Cold Spring Harbor found uh, over 700 life science PIs that they're not lacking for access to uh, computational resources or enough data storage. There are, in fact, many options available out there. And, um, the greatest unmet need is actually this lack of skilled workers. Um, and so let me see if I can get this to highlight. Yeah, so, so that all the top responses are centered on uh, training. And so uh, with this in mind, um, Cybers is set out to manage the entire uh, research object. So our, our goals are to help scientists uh, from the, the onset of their data collection to analyzing their data in our resources um, producing their analyses, and then moving on to help train others in their use. Uh, we have multiple setups available. So there's the public platform, which everyone can use. We have professional services, such that if you wanted to have a custom deployment on premises or on a commercial cloud, we can help set that up. We've done this uh, in the United Kingdom, in Austria. So we have a sister organization set up there. We're also uh, functioning in the health space and the defense space uh, with secure compliance for those uh, areas. So this layer cake slide uh, is just sort of a, an example of how our platform works. And at the top, we have our end user products. These are things with graphic user interfaces. They're, they're easy to use, so they're highly accessible to folks. And as you move down the stack uh, into our services, you gain flexibility. So you can pick and choose these uh, separate services that are available and finally land up on the, this bare metal hardware resource. So, the, the goal here is that you know, new users can start in the, the top of the stack and more advanced users can find their way down uh, deeper in the stack to leverage all of these different resources that we're helping to provide. Uh, this is a map of where Cybers operates. Um, we're centered at the University of Arizona, but our, uh, our data store is replicated nightly at the Texas Advanced Computing Center in Texas. Um, we are connected across the entire Exceed uh, framework over internet too. And uh, we leverage the open science grid for our users such that they can start high throughput computing jobs uh, across all those nodes uh, across the US. So this slide um, basically describes the two different types of um, uh, interfaces that our users see when they come into our data science workbench, which we call the discovery environment. And so um, I'm not gonna go through piece by piece, but 
essentially on the left side of the slide uh, are interactive development environments. So folks that are working in things like Project Jupiter or our studio or remote desktops, they will come into this and start uh, a virtual machine through our Kubernetes cluster, which uh, uses containers. It's backed up to our IRODS data store, which also connects out to S3. And it all comes with um, authentication, uh, which we provide to everyone. And this, this provides some level of security. On the right side um, are executable jobs. Uh, so these would be things like high throughput computing jobs or HPC jobs that are um, non-interactive. So it's an execution that you start. And we've built some custom deployments through our APIs, which then trigger uh, uh, HT Condor resources. Um, and those run on our infrastructure as well as attack. So, these, these two kind of main frameworks are, are how the system works and you guys are welcome to check out these slides later. Um, the, the newest thing that we're working on is this um, cloud uh, or container continuous analysis service. So we call it Cacao, but the idea is that we have many clouds available to us now and um, cloud is both general and very specific. And so you have many different providers uh, with different resources and there's a lot to learn about getting onto the cloud. And so what we're trying to do with Kakao is to simplify this process to enable users to come in and initiate their workflow analysis using things like declarative templates. And this is a multi-cloud system um, that helps users get in there and, and get started what they need to get done. So um, one of our main focus areas on training uh, revolves around new scientists. And so Many of the problems that we see as, as advanced uh, people in our mid-career, late career, you know, we're not thinking about these really basic issues, like how do I scale my data analysis up or, or how do I finish this thing so I can just graduate? And you know, we have new career people looking to write their first proposal. So how do they write a good data management plan? So we spend part of our time training new scientists how to do this um, in this new cloud native and reproducible uh, research framework. So if we think about, you know, what are the most foundational uh, open science skills that we need? We think about the fair data principles, uh, using open source software, contributing back to the open source community, commitments published in open access journals, uh, working with linked and open data, uh, with uh, metadata and schema. And then last, this um, DevOps mindset where we're in this continuous analysis framework, always thinking about improving and, and uh, executing on our, our analyses. So through our, our training programs, we're, we're trying to build these inclusive communities um, across the, the life sciences, earth sciences, space sciences. And it, it's really humbling to teach a couple day workshop. And by the end of it, you've got folks from this uh, diverse background assembling viral genomes or even running a GitHub action to, uh, to reproduce the uh, Event Horizon Telescope's black hole image. So you know, this can be done in, in a short time period, but the, the longer experience has to come from, from hands-on over you know, an entire career. So uh, just an example of one of our enabled collaborations, uh, CK Chan is an astronomer uh, at the University of Arizona and he's working on the Event Horizon Telescope, creating these simulations of um, the black holes. And uh, we've been able to help CK's work um, through a collaboration, both with the folks at uh, USC and ISI and their Pegasus workflow and the Open Science Grid. And so recently um, CK's team was the number one user of the Open Science Grid. So they were uh, using more hours than anyone else has ever used. And this framework that they've designed is based around um, their simulation data that they've got. And so they're producing thousands of simulations of the black hole. And then they're running this inner comparison um, across the different models to, to try to build a better uh, model of what the black hole really looks like. And so the tens of thousands of models comparing millions of times and uh, they use Cybers in the back end to manage their data. Um, this connects through Pegasus, the open science grid, and they're able to produce their science. And so these are slides which um, CK let me borrow, but essentially they're using Cybers mostly just for the back end with the data storage. And so far they've run a couple of uh, 100,000 jobs, millions of core hours, and it's some pretty exciting work that's going to be uh, coming out soon. So um, sort of to summarize, the, the way that we do this is that um, we have professional services, folks like me that talk to scientists, and we set up training, we work with 
getting you um, installation of our services on your platform or setting you up with um, services on our, our, our end of things. And then this focus on the entire data life cycle. So thinking about your science from the beginning to the end, and then last of uh, really working on training and, and making sure that we're enabling folks to do this on their own. Um, and I just wanna kind of close out with the, this concept of creating accessible platforms. So on the left is the example of our, our workbench where users can log in and within 30 seconds, they can drop into a, a remote instance with our studio or VS Code or, or Jupyter and be doing their science. And this is um, reducing the, the cognitive load on new users who may not know things about the command line or about the cloud. And so they can get started right away. On the right side is an example of our new cacao template where you can come in, you can uh, set up a, a deployment of multiple instances on our OpenStack clouds through Jetstream 2, and eventually we'll have the service set up through commercial cloud providers, but you can bring your container, uh, authenticate to your specific users and get going. And so this is hopefully lowering that barrier and the speed at which you can get going with your science. Uh, Cybers is fully funded by the National Science Foundation. So uh, we wanna thank the NSF for their, their support and their leadership. And I wanna thank you all for your time. Excellent. Thank you very much, Tyson. That was very interesting. All right. Um, and you finished under time. Nicely done. So next up, um, we're going to, I think we'll just save the, the discussions for, for after all of the sessions. Uh, but it's my privilege to introduce uh, Joe Hammond. He is the technology director at Carbon Plan and a project scientist at NCAR. His work was broadly focused on building open source tools for scientific computing, and this has included co-founding the Pangeo project and wide ranging contributions to the open source scientific Python ecosystem. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to, to you, Joe. Okay, can you hear me? We can, thank you. All it's right. Good. That's good. That's good. We're off to a good start. So yeah, well, hi, everyone. So yeah, my name is uh, Joe Hammond. And um, uh, like Luke said, I'm the uh, technology director at Carbon Plan. I'm also a, a staff scientist at NCAR. Um, and what, my work, uh, I'm a climate scientist by training. Uh, I spend most of my time doing open data and open source software stuff. Um, and that's included a lot of work on the Pangeo and X-Ray projects, and then the kind of ecosystem of Python tools and approaches that surround those. Um, and so today I'm going to talk about kind of what, from the Pangeo perspective, what those some of the key challenges to open science are and how the, the tools and approaches inside the Pangeo project have kind of uh, been developed to address those. So um, this is actually some text from our website that we wrote five years ago, and I wish it wasn't as accurate today as it uh, was five years ago, but um, some of these problems, many of these problems still exist and, and, and can be described um, in the same way. So, you know, I think the, the big data one is one that most people here um, are, are quite familiar with, but, you know, data sets are growing rapidly. I'll show a slide on this in a second. Um, but fundamentally, this is like poses a, a, a major obstacle to scientific progress when it comes to working with petabyte scale data sets. I think even the largest institutions in the world still struggle um, with petabyte scale data analysis. Uh, as we look around um, the difference between uh, the uh, private industry and um, scientific software um, space, we see that there's a pretty big technology gap. I, I think there's no question that um, industry has innovated in some really incredible ways, in the, um, particularly in the big data space in, in the last uh, decade or so. And I, I think you can make the argument that um, the scientific uh, you know, industry complex has lagged behind in some ways, um, also innovated in its own ways, but I think there's a, there's a clear gap. And then finally, reproducibility. I think the fragmentation of tools and environments across um, all of the different technologies and applications uh, make it really hard to put everything back together again. Um, so Pangeo aims to address uh, these challenges through a unified collaborative effort, and we do that by combining open source software, open data, and open infrastructure. Okay, so here's my big data slide. Everyone has this slide, but the point is the, the data sets we're dealing with today are going to look small in a couple of years, and we need to think about what sort of uh, platforms we're using, tools we're using for 
um, for, for doing our, our work with data um, come, going forward. So I think the, the, the logical conclusion from that last slide is not that we're going to have a lot of data. <laughs> it's that we need a new uh, class of data systems um, looking forward. And so um, you know, there's a there's a link here in the bottom. But a few years ago, we wrote a um, just like a short white paper um, on kind of what we think this new class of data systems might look like. Um, and in the, the the top line conclusions is uh, that you know what we're looking for is data systems that are powerful. Um, that can ma manage petabyte scale data sets um, that are flexible, that they can do many things. Uh, we uh, use the term or the phrase that science doesn't need a, uh, a train, it needs an, an all-terrain vehicle. Um, like uh, We're going to do a lot of different things with the data sets um, and, the, and the tools that we're building today. So uh, Performance in one dimension is not always uh, the most optimal solution. So uh, interactive, you know, especially for researchers doing exploratory research, uh, interactive is key, the ability to quickly iterate. And then um, cost effective, I know that came up earlier this morning, um, and sustainable uh, go hand in hand, but the ability to um, build and maintain these tools um, in a, at a reasonable cost. Okay, so in steps the Pinchio project. Um, and, and really the Pangeo project has come to mean three things and I'll kind of walk through all three of those meanings. Um, ultimately, it's a community focused on open science, building tools and methods um, and, and, um, and, and data products. So um, like I said, it's a community, uh, it promotes open, reproducible and scalable science. It also is sometimes, the, the term Pangeo is also sometimes um, used to refer to an ecosystem of open source software tools mostly Python tools and mostly focused on geoscience, but like that's not uh, like a firm, um, it's a dashed line you might draw around a set of tools. And then Pangeo, it's a platform. So you can like uh, install a Pangeo thing on uh, Kubernetes cluster if you want, um, but it's more conceptually a platform also that like pulls together some, some loose ideas, which I'll walk through. One of the, uh, the unique things about the Pangeo project is the data model or the development model that it employs. And so from the very beginning, we started as a group of scientists and software developers and infrastructure providers. And uh, we built this kind of development model where science use cases and challenges um, that scientists are running into inform the development of new tools and infrastructure and that we've managed to iterate in a really uh, seamless and quick uh, fashion. And so uh, out of that has come a lot of contributions to the open source uh, Python ecosystem. Um, and we've been mainly extending existing libraries and integrating those libraries to support uh, new use cases. We've done this on HPC and on cloud. Um, and almost everything I'm going to talk about today is um, is kind of backend agnostic, but uh, and I think that's been a real success. There's like um, at Incar we have say a Jupiter Hub that uh, enables the same sort of workflow that you could um, you could access on the cloud through a Jupiter Hub um, on Kubernetes, and so that sort of flexibility has been really important. And coming back to this, the scientists have really defined the science questions and the challenges they're they're running into. The community has um, spanned, uh, spans a really wide range of, of user and developer groups. And I won't go through all of this, but a, a few key things is we've had funding from NSF and from, and from NASA and, and actually from a few other organizations now. We've worked with all of the major cloud providers and the list of um, institutions span private industry to um, you know, uh, research uh, labs. Um, and they actually, we actually sample from a handful of um, uh, existing communities. So the Jupyter community is a, is one, the PyData um, or SciPy community is another. And um, so it's kind of a, a, a nexus of, um, of collaboration. It's an internet community as well. Um, there's not like a, there's no Pangeo.org. Um, there's not, it's not a nonprofit or anything like that. It's like a GitHub organization and a discourse channel, um, and 
all the work that's done is done collaboratively on um, these open platforms. So I think that's a unique thing about um, the Pangeo project that there, uh, there are some grants that have supported people's work, but there is no central um, governing body. There is a, a steering council um, that I'm a part of, um, but there is not like a top, there's not a concrete top-down leadership. Okay, so this was our original arch architecture diagram. Um, and it's actually quite simple. It starts on the left with analysis ready data, which I'll, I'll talk more about, um, but distributed storage that can provide high bandwidth um, access to data. And then we attach that distributed storage to a bunch of computers. That could be the cloud, could be an HPC, it doesn't really matter. But that, the point is um, inside of that cloud and HPC environment, we have some way to scale uh, computation in, um, horizontally. We use the Dask um, library to do that um, uh, early on. We still, we still use Dask a lot, but it's not the only way to do this. Um, and then X-Ray is a data model for multidimensional um, data analysis. And it has really become one of the core um, tools on which a lot of extensions can be built. And the, the user uh, connects to this architecture through a web browser, so a thin web client. Um, the computation and the, the server is running on the cloud or HPC, uh, but the end user just connects to that up through their, through their browser. And so this is the, um, you know, this, this has become somewhat of a commonplace diagram. I think even the talk before was describing something similar, but the ability to scale out horizontally with Dask was one of the more novel pieces here. Um, and, and really allows us to allowed us to start tackling this like many uh, you know tens or hundreds of terabytes to petabyte scale problem. Okay, so this is the same uh, the same concept. Um, and this is kind of how we've generalized in many ways our understanding. Um, and apologies for these last two. The prefect and beam uh, did not come through with the animation correctly, but. Um, so, you know, I, I just showed this, uh, this architecture diagram in a slightly different way in the previous slide, but you have your compute cluster, you have your object store, those live in some cloud space, and then you have some way to like drive that computation um, via um, a thin client. On the, uh, on the object store, on the data storage side, uh, the key thing here is not how the data, like that it's object store, it's that the data is um, in analysis ready and cloud optimized data formats. So that could be Parquet, it could be Cloud Optimized GeoTIFF, and increasingly for us, it has meant uh, the ZAR data format, which is a new data format for chunked multidimensional arrays. Uh, on, the, on the right, we have these scalable um, parallel computing frameworks. So we have um, uh, kind of incumbents in the space, Hadoop and Spark that many know about, and then there's um, Dask, which we've used, which um, is, a, is a DAG-based graph um, parallel computing framework. Um, and then there's more uh, workflow engine style um, tools that have recently come out of the scene. Prefect and Apache Beam are two of those. So you could mix and match this a bunch of different ways. Um, and you can actually like take out this kind of interactive piece and turn it into a batch processing framework and everything else stays the same. Uh, I, I also mentioned that uh, Pinchio is an, is kind of referred refers to it, the ecosystem of tools, and so this is the scientific Python ecosystem. Um, Jake Vanderplas gave this slide, uh, and it, we've been like manipulating it into our own thing over the last five or six years. But um, you know, Python is at the center of this, and the the one of the coolest things about the Python um, ecosystem is that it does kind of, it's like peeling back the layers of an onion, and as you um, as you go further out in the onion, you get the more domain specific or application specific um, tools and they, they all kind of build on each other in, um, in, in, in um, positive ways. So uh, we have focused, er, we focused early on at integrating these uh, first three libraries, Dask, X-Ray and Jupyter. Um, and since then we've been working um, on a bunch of other things. So I, there's a handful of libraries here. I won't go through all of them um, that enabled either specific science applications or specific technical um, functionalities. FS spec is one that I, I like I, I, is, is as an example is a library for accessing data remote data. Um, and you know you can make the argument it should be a layer down in this model uh, in this um, in this figure. but the, the concept is that 
uh, like all of these fit together in, a, in, a, in an interesting way and we try to do our best to connect them. I want to just like pause for a moment and just like harp on the concept of X-ray um, as, a, as, a, as a bit of an aside. So X-ray is a Python library for working with multi-dimensional labeled arrays and data sets. And I, I think it's one of these kind of underappreciated data models. It's based on the NetCDF data model. And uh, on top of that is a toolkit for doing a lot of scientific analysis. And it, uh, it's connected with um, multiple parallel computing frameworks like Dask, um, allowing it to scale out. Um, but it also is like a data model that has metadata and all, all sorts of things. And so one of the things we've seen uh, other frameworks try to do that um, is kind of this, this is a need that almost everyone that's working with multidimensional scientific data has is to build these kind of linked um, uh, data sets. And X-ray is something that serves that need in a generic way. Um, and I think it's one of those foundational data models that uh, we should be focused on. Two minute warning, Joe. Perfect. One more slide. Um, okay, so really quickly, the um, I wanted to show an example of an integration project that we've been working on. So this is the Pangeo ML project. This is an, a NASA access grant that's active right now that I'm leading. And uh, the, the concept here is that we want to improve the um, interoperability of the scientific Python tools for doing machine learning. and I, I think that, you know, obviously this is a machine learning slide. It's not um, maybe directly relevant to everything that we're talking about here, but I think the key point is that the uh, concept of integrating existing tools. So we're not really building anything new here. We're just working on um, the integration of existing tools. And so the, the idea of this whole project is to improve the, uh, the researcher's experience um, going from cloud hosted data through their ETL steps uh, their exploratory data visualization, model design, and, and then training and validation. All right, so my, my last slide is on the Pangeo Forge project. Pangeo Forge is, a, um, is, is kind of a sub-project under the Pangeo domain that is um, really focused on built, democratizing the development um, and production of analysis-ready cloud-optimized data. And the idea is that uh, what we've found is in developing Pangeo in the cloud is that building cloud optimized data sets is among the hardest parts uh, and, and is a limiting factor in how we, um, any sort of migration to the cloud. And I know NASA is working really hard to figure out how to do this on its, um, for its existing archives. But the, the idea is that we can crowdsource the development of cloud optimized data through the development of recipes and then Pangeo Forge will provide the infrastructure and the automation tooling to make that possible. So starting with say an HTTP or FTP server running against existing, uh, running a recipe on um, managed compute infrastructure and then producing a cloud bucket with a data catalog um, for, um, end for you know, multiple end users. The, the goal is really to develop the data lake of the future um, of crowdsourced um, analysis ready uh, data. So that was my last slide um, and looking forward to the conversation at the end here. Excellent. Thank you so much, Joe. Very nicely done. I think you've got some questions in the chat um, and then please, uh, of course, stick around for the Q&A after the, this group of sessions. All right. And now uh, we are going to move over to um, the Alaska SAR facility and we've got Kirk Hoganson uh, will be joining us. He's the Alaska SAR facility deputy DAC manager. Uh, he's background in education and mathematics, but he spent most of his career as a software developer. He's been with ASF for 18 years as both a developer and a development manager. So Kirk, take it away. Thank you. All right. Uh, everything working here. looks like my slides are being shared and then you and you can hear me? All right. Perfect. Uh, yeah, so I'm um, Kirk Owinson. I'm the Deputy Deck Manager at ASF. So maybe we don't fit exactly under the, the this other data systems you know, session, but it, what we're doing is, um, um, is does feel different, but it's also part of sort of a whole uh, you know, NASA effort to, to move towards open science. And I guess what I'd like to talk about today, maybe I'll jump to the next slide here, um, is um, a couple of tools and or systems that we've built um, at ASF, um, which actually there's, there's a really good story here, I guess, and how you know these tools were built for, for one purpose and then 
in the end, we've sort of seen how they can all fit together to facilitate this idea of, you know, open science and reproducible results and and, and everything. So, so um, I'm not going to get into the story though. I'm going to try to talk about sort of the, the end game here. And um, and so so these are the pieces I'm going to talk about today. So the we have the the you know open star lab system that was talked about by um, Franz Meyer in the, the first workshop for this effort. Also, I'll kind of remind everybody what that's about, but I won't dig too far into that. Uh, the second system I want to talk about today is the, the HYPE system. That's the hybrid pluggable processing pipeline, which is a, a cloud-based system for doing um, at-scale processing in, in the cloud. And then uh, and those two systems, OpenStar Lab and, and HYPE, were built by ASF. Uh, the Cumulus system is an ESDIS effort that ASF is um, involved in um, somewhat, and we're leveraging to build data ingest systems at um, ASF, which is, which is a NASA DAC. And then uh, the last piece, which is, um, you know, the, the fourth piece is not really a system or a tool. It's sort of the, the, the notion of a, of a DAC in general and what role it can play in, in, in how these systems can uh, play to open science, I guess, and support the idea of um, open science in general. So that's sort of my plan. So talk about each of these systems um, and then talk about how they can fit together in a way we didn't originally envision, but actually I think is a really nice way to facilitate um, I think what we all want to uh, accomplish here. So starting with uh, Open Star Lab, this is the slide that uh, Franz Meyer showed in uh, his session earlier. The system has evolved a little bit. Some of these details are out of date, but the, the, the idea is it's a, it's a, um, a Jupyter notebook based system uh, running in the cloud that sits next to a lot of NASA data. And it's got a lot of pre-installed tools for doing um, uh, analysis with um, you know, the Python, the Python scientific ecosystem, and um, a lot of SAR specific tooling. So this this originally was built as, a, as an analysis platform on on SAR, uh, but we're I guess what I'm envisioning uh, this thing could um, evolve to and and has evolved to to a certain extent at ASF is um, to use the language that Natasha used earlier, move from an analysis platform to a you know data generation engine. And uh, you know it's got all the benefits of you know Jupyter Hub and, and, and Jupyter Labs. I won't ignore Jupyter Labs, um, where you can do collaborative development. The system is run in the cloud, so you can work together with people on a on a common platform. And we've used it um, in a in a number of classes at the university, where uh, all the students um, log into OpenStar Lab to do their um, uh, to do their homework assignments, do their workflows. Um, and you know, like other people have mentioned, it's similar to, to some other systems we've talked about it in this in this whole workshop. Uh, all right, I think that's enough to say about that. Uh, the hype system is, is um, I don't think we mentioned it in, in this session, is, is this uh, system for scalable processing in the cloud. So this is a, it's built around AWS Batch and it's it, you, based on um, you know, Docker containers that contain the, the, the processing algorithms. And it, so it's an efficient and cost-effective cloud-based system for generating a lot of data very quickly. And we've used it in a bunch of projects at ASF um, in, in collaboration with a lot of partners who want to do, um, you know, have, have mature um, algorithms that they want to process on a, a lot of data. And so we've partnered with a number of um, uh, organizations, and I'll talk about one later specifically, where uh, this system was used to, uh, you know, cost effectively process um, a lot of data um, when, when uh, you know, many uh, scientists don't have the compute infrastructure that they've, they've got the science knowledge to build a, a sophisticated algorithm that, that they're really happy with. But what um, often is the challenge is taking that to you know, the, the engineering part of it, where you have to take your science and, to, and process it on a lot of data, you know, region or global scales, what, what uh, we like to say. And uh, so the system works by um, starting and ending in S3, the whole thing lives in the cloud. And so um, I guess to tease where I'm going with this is, you know, Open Star Lab lives in the cloud, and you can, uh, you know, uh, scientists can collaboratively develop sort of a sophisticated, you know, scientific algorithm that they're happy with that produces data that they want to provide to the world uh, at a, uh, you know, globally. Um, and then they so they do want to do a lot of processing, and so the the, the transition has to take their their notebook to um, a container that can run inside this hype system. And so we've been working, uh, it's, it's a little bit of a, you know, an engineering effort to make that transition from, um, here's a notebook that, uh, you know, works on, on, the, on the, the 
the data products that, you know, that I've been working with and, and, and I, but now I want to take it to, the, to do it on the whole Amazon basin or the whole world. Um, and so that's the engineering part and that's where um, this system comes into play. And then the, the next step, I guess, is, uh, you know, we've got all this data, now what do we do with it? And um, that, that's where this uh, cumulus architecture comes. What, what, and uh, maybe, um, I, I know I have the cumulus architecture diagram there, but I'm not gonna dig into that. I think the key point for, for cumulus is that it's a um, sort of a standardized way for data to get into um, a NASA data archive. And the advantage of this is that it's, it's very easy now, or, or will be once I think, once the system you know, sort of fully, fully matures, is for uh, a, a data generated by a system like Hype to be um, ingested into a, a NASA data archive, which I think is maybe the, the, the sort of key part of, of getting you know, open science, I guess, is the, you know, it's, um, it's, it's the last step of it in the chain of getting the, the data. So it's fully available, fully open to everyone is having it available at a, at a place where people are used to coming for data. You know, a, a NASA DAC is the perfect place. And NASA has been moving to the cloud. And we talk a lot about how that data can then be consumed by scientists to do things efficiently. This is sort of closing the loop where you can consume it efficiently in a system like um, OpenSAR Lab or, or Pangeo or anything you want, and then feed that data back into the archive at the end of it so that uh, we have uh, another data set available to everyone and the whole cycle can start again. That's uh, maybe a spoiler alert for where I'm going with all this. Uh, and, so, and so this is it. So um, the, the idea is that with an um, a open platform like um, OpenSAR Lab, scientists can collaboratively develop um, scientific implementations, um, including and, and, you know, test data sets and validation data, and um, everything is going to be entirely reproducible as that notebook gets converted into a container. And then that container can serve as, can, can be part of a long term archive for a data set. You know, a, a, a DAC's job is to be sort of a long term, and, and, and you know, at, a, at a DAC, we're used to thinking about the long term. We're thinking about, you know, when the world is destroyed, how can we make sure this data is still available? And so, uh, Reproducibility is a is a sort of a new emphasis as part of that. You know, how can the code that's that's used to generate this data be, be there? But a container is even more permanent because all of the dependencies, all of the operating systems that are used, uh, that never changes in the container. So a container being part of a long-term archive for a data set is um, is really advantageous. And so this is how it all fits together. Yeah, you got the algorithm development, uh, the, the containerization, and then the at scale processing. The standardized ingest, and then it lands in a, in a, in a uh, an archive like ASFs, but or any NASA DAC, and there is an approval process for that. But I think what we're talking about here is you know greasing the wheels a little bit on on that process and facilitating data getting into archives like ASF that uh, you know anybody can use and are, are are fully open, and and as part of that archive, then we have the, the containers. Um, all of the test data sets that were used, um, the, the, the validation information, and then it's easy for people to take that, that algorithm and run it on data sets that they um, you know, that weren't part of the original archive generation or um, have some parameters tweaked um, as the user would like to do. So that's um, sort of the way we see how all this fits together. And I've kind of mixed a couple of things here. We have these operational systems, you know, OpenSAR Lab, Hype, um, cumulus and then the, sort of the ASF infrastructure. Uh, what's what's a little bit um, at the front of what I'm talking about is, is plugging it all together. Uh, and so I'll talk. I guess we have a couple of examples where that has this whole thing has come together and and, and works end to end. But um, at this point, the, the systems have been operating mostly independently. Uh, but anyway, let me summarize the, uh, the sort of advantages of what I'm talking about here. Uh, so the the data remains in AWS throughout the entire life. So the, these systems are built on AWS. So this is not a system that um, is, you know, doesn't, it, I think we're looking at possibilities for having it run on Google Cloud or on Azure. But right now, this is an AWS focused system. Uh, all of the code for these systems is um, fully open sourced. Uh, they're are in public GitHub repositories. Uh, and then I mentioned the, the advantages here of having the, the notebooks that are used to build the data sets and all the validation information and all of the documentation that becomes part of the, uh, the, the standard um, archive responsibilities for, for a DAC. 
And that really facilitates um, taking those algorithms and then users um, customizing them for their own purposes or, uh, or just leveraging them in areas that it, they weren't originally used on. Um, and then it, the, maybe the last um, benefit to emphasize here is, is the, the thing I kind of led in with is because the data is housed at a DAC, you get all of the sort of future proofing that DACs give you. Uh, you know, we're at the DACs I'm heavily involved in building um, you know, cloud-based tools to uh, enact, enable easy access to data, you know, direct X3 access that is R and, and, and the Harmony system that was being worked on to allow, um, you know, efficient uh, access to, to data sets and, and, and fusion of data sets. Those things um, can all come along and, 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 as, and in the future, data sets that are generated using this process will benefit from those um, things as they're, as they're built in the future. So uh, I guess just to sort of remind people where we're at here, the, the, the three systems there, those three systems are operational, have been used, uh, in use for, you know, producing, um, uh, you know, at scale data sets. Uh, you know, I think I mentioned the Open SAR Lab and um, the courses that they were using, it was also used in the, in the NAFCA training. It was used by the NISAR science team to develop the level three guns for the upcoming NISAR mission. We have the hype system that's been used to generate a, a lot of data at scale. And then um, Cumulus is, a, is the, you know, the standardized ingest system. Uh, and so those three systems are, are um, fairly mature and are being used in a, in a number of different contexts. And then we have the one case where all three of these have been uh, plugged together to um, do sort of an end-to-end -end workflow. And it's a little bit of an exaggeration that one plugged together. I think the original algorithm generation for this, uh, this, is, this is a glacier um, monitoring data set um, as part of the It's Live measures project. Uh, the, the, the original algorithm was developed in Jupyter Notebooks, but it wasn't on Open Star Lab, but, uh, but, a, but a similar uh, um, concept. And then it was containerized, rolled into the hype system. The processing was done uh, in a, in a separate, separately funded AWS account because the hype system is fully open source and fully redeployable. Uh, they were able to generate the, um, all of the data you know, in just a couple of weeks. And that data is um, going to be ingested by NSIDC um, I don't think they're planning to actually use cumulus for it, but but the uh, but the whole but the handoff is there for the data to be generated, um, processed, or, or, or the algorithm developed, the data to be generated and processed, and handed to a, a DAC for long-term archive, um, all in the cloud, and um, cost-effectively and efficiently. And that's that's sort of the vision that uh, we have here is that, uh, and maybe the the, the key point is that. Uh, the, the DAC engineers and the DAC um, developers that are, you know, are, that are that manage the hype system, they are um, involving them slightly earlier in the, I guess it may scroll back to this, having the DAC engineers come in uh, a little bit earlier in the, in the process um, sort of really enhances the, the long-term uh, nature of what we're doing here. The, the, the data, data produced um, will be, uh, you know, more reproducible, easily um, applied to other data sets and uh, you know, sort of readily um, integrated into the, the, the NASA infrastructure of the long-term data archive. All right, let me jump back over here again with my closing thoughts. I think um, I'm still not over time. And this is a, uh, um, a lot of this have already said, I guess. The, the, um, the, the, these systems were built originally with a slightly different purpose in mind, but uh, but the, the the synergy of these is really advantageous thing for what we're talking about with um, facilitating collaborative development, you know, with with a, a Jupyter notebook based system, um, efficiently moving that to um, uh, at scale processing on global original scales, and then uh, having that sort of flow naturally into the DAC infrastructure where we have long term availability. Um, and you know, we just heard from Pangeo. I'd love to see. Um, that be part of this chain as well. And, uh, and then I guess my last point there is a little bit of plug for the DAX system where the, the, I think having the DAX part of open science is a really natural fit for uh, you know, everything that we're trying to do here with open science. All right, I think I better shut up. I think that is my, I think that's my 15 minutes. So thank you. And um, uh, hopefully I didn't uh, blaze through that too far. Thank you. Excellent job. Thank you, Kirk. Uh, and a great job on, on your timeliness. Just perfect. All right. Oh. All right. Thank you again. Uh, please stick around for the Q&A. Looking forward to, to that discussion. Uh, so next up, uh, we have the Raytheon Corporation uh, 
Sean Miller is going to be our presenter from Raytheon. Sean is a principal engineering fellow and certified architect with the Raytheon Intelligence in Space, uh, RINS. And within RINS, he is currently the technical director for environmental intelligence and civil space, overseeing current technical performance and plan capabilities and technological evolution of multiple programs in the weather, water, and climate enterprise. Uh, previously, he was the chief architect on the Joint Polar Satellite System, Common Ground System. He's been working in various aspects of weather and satellite programs for 30 years, 24 of those with Raytheon. He obtained a PhD in aerospace engineering sciences at the University of Colorado Boulder in 95 and worked as a postdoc researcher in the Department of Meteorology at the University of Maryland. So Sean, welcome and uh, take it away. Thank you very much, Luke. Uh, can you hear me? Perfect. Yep, sounds great. All right. Um, well, thank you everybody for, sorry, I'm <laughs> advancing before I get through this. So uh, first of all, thank you to, to the organizers of this workshop. This is, uh, I'm already learning a ton of things just off of the few presentations that preceded me. So uh, really, really happy to be able to participate, uh, represent what Raytheon is doing here. Uh, you're gonna see a couple common themes uh, with stuff that has been uh, talked about before and also an overloaded acronym, which I'll show you in a minute. Um, I want to thank uh, my uh, co-author for this, Nicole Hafke. She leads a lot of our internal research and development work here at, at Raytheon. So um, what I'm going to go through today, uh, we have uh, several, uh, call them building blocks, uh, that we think could be thrown in the melting pot here with these other great uh, ideas and, and, and tools. Uh, so we'll be walking through a few of the most relevant one of those. Um, and we'll start with a community center approach uh, that we're currently employing for the NOAA EPIC program, uh, which I'll go to in a minute. Uh, we've noted uh, in parallel with other discussions with the community, we've noted a lot of uh, interest in uh, CICD pipelines and processes surrounding that. So I'll talk a little bit about uh, how that applies and some of the technologies that we're using there. Uh, and then I'll talk a little bit more about some of the IRAD efforts uh, that Nicole and others are working on. Uh, here at the company that I think could, could be useful here. So starting with this sort of uh, community center approach, uh, we just, uh, we started up uh, the NOAA EPIC program, which is the Earth Innovation, Earth Prediction Innovation Center uh, last year. Uh, we were very fortunate to be selected to work with NOAA on that and with the community that's uh, improving the weather models via the unified forecast system. And there's a lot of similar needs there. Um, you know, how do you get innovation accelerated? In that case, it's how do we get advancements all the way out to operationally in the weather models that are used uh, continually, uh, both globally and regionally. And uh, that program has, has been going through the usual startup stuff, but this is, this is kind of a similar concept to what is needed there. And, and it's very community centric, uh, things like hackathons and training and outreach. Uh, we have a web portal up. If you go to epic.noaa.gov, you can see the, the latest incarnation of that. And the whole idea is to try to bring the community to get together and make them more aware of what's out there, not just the science, but also the data that you need to, to build and test the science and then uh, all the tools uh, that are available uh, to accelerate all of that. So, so that kind of uh, that way of thinking is kind of embedded in, in where we're headed. Uh, both there and, and some other programs that we have. Uh, in terms of what kind of an architecture can support that, we have a few building blocks that I'll walk through in a little bit more detail here. Um, here I'm kind of showing a similar diagram to some things that I've seen uh, in some of the other presentations, uh, data coming in on the left through some sort of secure access. Um, and then in the background of this figure, this data fabric concept, this is something we've been putting some investment into over the last couple of years. And the idea there is there's, there's data stored in a lot of places that you might need to get to and different kinds of systems with different access methods. And so we're kind of looking at how do we make it easier uh, to unify that into a single API to the user uh, so that they don't have to worry about the disparate things that are behind all that. And, and you can just use one sort of common way of getting access to the data you need. And then surrounding that, there's all the potential ways that you can use the data. So I'll talk a little bit about data processing heritage that we can potentially bring to bear here. 
uh, both from our own forge, uh, which I'll talk about, and then also uh, the Joint Polar Satellite System has been processing data uh, at high speed for a long time, and there's things, things that can be borrowed from there. In concert with that, we've looked at some IRAD uh, adjacent to that and how we can bring machine learning into that framework uh, to help with the whole problem of there being too much data and not knowing which is the right data to get access to at any given moment. Uh, and then finally, uh, we have a tool called ALIAS, uh, which I always forget how that acronym spells out. I think I have it on the slide, but um, it's basically to help accelerate the process of labeling the data, uh, which is often a huge time consuming step uh, when you're using any kind of machine learning algorithm. So a little bit more about a couple process things, uh, Agile and DevSecOps. They probably all have heard those terms a number of times more frequently recently. Some of you have probably even practiced it uh, to some extent. Uh, but one thing we're looking at here, Raytheon does both of these on a wide range of programs for different missions and customers, but how does it best apply to the problem at hand for science? So, you're not necessarily, you know, these things kind of came out of production systems and operations and the need to rapidly upgrade there. It's a slightly different use case. Uh, you know, the science and the associated models aren't necessarily changing rapidly enough to actually be running DevSecOps somewhere on a system, but they both still have um, pieces that you can use as processes. Uh, one example of that uh, is the glueware that's often needed to tie different uh, models together. Uh, if you're trying to test out a new scientific concept, uh, that, that might uh, update more rapidly and it might be better to have something like that available to the community. And then just adding some structure to the whole process of trying innovative ideas and being able to repeatedly test those uh, against some sort of control. Uh, I think all of that uh, can benefit from the kinds of things that Agile and, and DevSecOps uh, bring to the table. Um, we actually put this together for, um, for a presentation at the American Meteorological Society uh, with regard to EPIC and how DevSecOps could apply there. Um, and this is kind of walking through how does that change uh, for open, re open source science and the things that this community needs to do. So for example, on the left-hand side, we have the, the major steps that usually come into DevSecOps all the way from planning to deploying out to monitoring what you've deployed and then using that a, a feedback loop back into more planning on what you want to upgrade. And then we've got the traditional definitions of the things that you would do with that type of a production system. And on the right, we've kind of tried to take a look at how does that change uh, in more of a research uh, scenario. So uh, instead of looking at a feature backlog uh, from operations, you collaborate through the community center that I talked about on what are the science priorities? Where do we need more innovations uh, and, and that kind of thing? A little bit more emphasis on the glueware in some of these steps. And then depending on where you are, the, to me, one of the most reusable pieces of DevSecOps for research is the, is the test part. Using automated test tools and standard input and output data sets so you can repeatedly test uh, new ideas and not just from one researcher, but you know, across the community how can we get a better handle on that? So I'll walk through this whole table for, for time constraint purposes, but I just wanted to kind of give this out there as a thought of how the community can best leverage these type of processes. So look, underneath that, there, there's a couple of, of technological building blocks. Um, so uh, all of us, I think, are familiar with Kubernetes and, and all these automated tools and things that, you know, we've seen some of those things mentioned already in the previous presentation, so I won't dive into that. Uh, I'll mention that, uh, like everybody, we, we've kind of put together our own sort of standard way of rapidly deploying an environment in which you can do that and call it a platform in a box. Um, it's not, you know, the, the tools that we use there, you know, you could use any number of, of tools. It's great to see the competition out there and the available options you can use for automated tests or deploying a system in an automated fashion. Uh, but that's just to say that we have something that we've documented to a degree that we can reuse pretty rapidly uh, when a new program or even an existing program wants to explore something. And then on the left, uh, I've got uh, our forge uh, compared to the Pangeo forge. So di different uh, applications. In this case, this is actually a mission uh, with the US Space Force. So it's a future operationally resilient ground evolution. 
and we've been uh, working on the mission data processing application framework uh, for that program. And the central data use there is uh, overhead persistent IR. Uh, so, you know, the main mission of that is, is to track uh, missile warnings and, and things like that, but it also has a wide range of other uses. Uh, just to give one example, uh, wildfires, uh, the ability to continuously monitor what's happening in real time uh, with that type of a developing uh, situation. So that's kind of what motivated the system. And so it needs to be pretty bulletproof and it needs to be able to upgrade the algorithms within it uh, pretty quickly. And the main thing that Forge brings to the table is takes this DevSecOps pipeline and, and uh, accelerates the ability to onboard new algorithms, essentially. And this can include uh, an algorithm from any source, uh, basically as, as a test. In order to win that program, we had to demonstrate that we could take a third-party application we'd never seen before and upload it into the system, including security scans and all that stuff, uh, without touching the code. And we were able to do that. So that, that's really the key thing that, that uh, Forge brings. Uh, and it's got that data processing flavor as well. So hopefully we can have more conversations as we go about that. Uh, this chart, I'm just kind of showing a little bit about how uh, our pipeline at a box that I mentioned kind of compares to un underlying infrastructure uh, with an example here being platform one, uh, also from uh, DOD. Uh, you know, so you got the infrastructure layers uh, down at the bottom, all the way up through terraforming to, to actually provision the infrastructure. And then these pipelines like pipeline the box and there are plenty of other options uh, bring in all the uh, Kubernetes orchestration, all the things that fall on top of that. So that's simply just to give some more context on how all that stuff fits together. Now I'll, uh, I'll shift gears real quickly to another aspect of data processing that we can bring to bear here. Uh, I mentioned uh, the JPSS program. We've been processing satellite data and operations for uh, over a decade on that program now. And one of the most exciting things is that uh, a little over a year ago, we were able to transition to operations in AWS's cloud. So this functionality is now completely uh, operating in the cloud and it's been able to do so and still maintain its latency performance. So that's really exciting. Um, what that also does is it opens up the ecosystems that you can unleash in the cloud, whether that's machine learning, uh, the ability to fire up GPUs if they're needed to, to enhance the processing. And it kind of opens up the door when you get data right down onto the ground. The first thing you can do is use machine learning and automation detection algorithms to see if there's something there that needs to be flagged in the metadata for downstream applications. Um, so what this could enable, for example, is if, if there's a storm potentially in the imagery, you could you flag that and then the National Hurricane Center can see uh, that maybe that's going on. Um, you can look for maybe unstable profiles uh, in the uh, IR data, uh, pretty much anything you can think of, uh, this kind of offers, offers the ability to do that. And the intent here is to help with that whole problem of whittling the data down so that any given user that has a given application knows uh, what's the most important data for them to use. And we're continuing to invest in this uh, as we go. And then uh, alias, I had mentioned earlier, uh, th there's your spell out for you, automated labeling for interactive assisted segmentation. Basically, this is an interactive way to label data as you're training an algorithm with machine learning. So uh, the human does a little bit of there, there at the top and then the machine takes that and runs with it. And then most of what the human's labor can be spent on after that is making adjustments instead of having to, to label everything uh, in the imagery. And we've already seen this in a number of applications uh, greatly reduce the amount of time uh, that it takes uh, to go through that whole process. And here's an example just of us using it on a potential use case, looking at biz IR data to train IR only data, uh, you know, sounding data to detect clouds. Uh, maybe, there, maybe this can improve the efficiency uh, for satellite data simulation, uh, as an example. So going Good back- Good morning. Honest, Two minutes, Sean. Okay, thank you. Good, I'm just about there. Um, going back to our original architecture diagram, just kind of revisiting where all those little pieces that I mentioned fit in. 
Uh, I see a lot of other exciting pieces brought by uh, the other folks here. So looking forward to see uh, see where this all goes for a, for a unified community solution. Um, so we prevent, presented some uh, building blocks and processes. Happy to talk afterwards in the chat or uh, any other way we want to do that. And we look forward to uh, continuing to work on this. Excellent. Thank you so much, Sean. Great presentation. Yeah, please do stick around. There's going to be a Q&A session after our next presenter, uh, and I'm sure the, the working group would have uh, a great demand for your, your time to answer some questions and follow up. Thank you. All right. Uh, as I just mentioned, we are going to move into our last session before we head into a break. Um, so. Uh, Proud to to uh, introduce Dan Pallone. He is the CEO and CTO of Element Eighty Four, a software development firm specializing in large scale geospatial data systems and remote sensing. And he oversees the architecture, design, and development for Element Eighty Four's commercial and government clients, including NASA, USGS, Stanford University School of Medicine, and Capella Space. He supported NASA's Earth Observing System for over 15 years, currently acting as Chief Technologist for the NASA EOSDIS Evolution and Development Contract. He has led multiple working groups on data services and cloud architectures, authored studies on architecture and transition plans for cloud native data management solutions, and helped shape software development processes for both government and commercial clients. Mr. Pallone has authored multiple books on software development and taught, taught software engineering at Catholic University in Washington, DC. So Dan, take it away. Well, thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Um, we've had some great talks uh, this week. And so uh, I wanted to steer this one a little bit differently uh, in the sense of kind of coming at it deliberately from a commercial perspective. Uh, so as um, a, a number of you know, I, I've been involved in the US DIS for years. Uh, but for this talk, I'm wearing my Element 84 hat. Uh, please don't hold that against me. And I'm going to try really hard to get this into 15 minutes. So I'm going to talk about FilmDrop. Um, FilmDrop is our geospatial processing stack and geospatial data lake management solution. Um, it is open sourced. Uh, just about everything in it is open sourced, including the contributions we've made back out. Um, Fundamentally, it looks like exactly what you would expect. On the left-hand side, you have a bunch of different data sources that we can pull into FilmDrop. We can do processing, product generation, et cetera. And then all of that sets up a data lake with security controls around it so that we can then build solutions on top of that, dashboards, visualizations, Jupyter Notebook for um, programmatic level access and things like that. Um, it is operational. It is fully in production. Um, we've used it with a commercial satellite uh, operator, Hydrosat, to produce fused uh, land surface temperature products. Uh, we've used it with Capella Space to do SAR image processing and generation. Uh, we've used it with the United Nations Department of Policy and Peacekeeping uh, to do custom product generation, kind of higher level analytics products, uh, automated analysis across it, and then dashboard generation on top of that. And then we've applied it to AWS's public data set program um, we have an API available that uh, has indexed and made searchable the um, public data set program or public data set holdings, the open data. Uh, behind the scenes, that's powered by FilmDrop. We're doing ongoing forward processing of Sentinel data. We've got about 16 million scenes going through there, about 14 petabytes of data. Um, the search API handles on a low day about 180,000 searches and on a high day about 14 million searches. Um, and ultimately, this was used to feed uh, an effort with Geoscience Australia to produce uh, Digital Earth Africa, which is um, a data cube in uh, Cape Town. So. As that is the context, let me talk a little bit about the project itself. So the project actually, or the film drop actually kind of spun out of an effort we did as part of a NASA access project where we needed to do a bunch of ISAT2 processing. Um, we we're doing ISAT2, we we're doing some Sentinel2, and we needed to automate that processing stack. We're a small business, and so kind of throwing people at the problem is always the worst answer for us. So it's kind of how do we automate uh, these solutions? We had been using spatiotemporal asset catalogs or stack with out the K uh, on a for a bunch of different places for metadata holdings and things like that. And what we did was we extended that out to include what we call a process field. And so what we were able to put together was this idea of every piece of data input that was going into the system had an associated stack record with it, and it had a processing field in it. That processing field identified the processor that we needed to apply. It would run through the system. The data that was spit out of the other end of it uh, also got a stack catalog record or stack record next to it. And that record had uh, the full provenance information of everything we had done to it on the way out. And what that let us do is actually set up a, what could be a self-feeding system. Since we spoke stack from one end to the other, we could output a set of data, 
stack records next to it that could then be fed into the next processing level that we needed to do or the next product we needed to generate or whatever we wanted to do. I'm going to come back to this at the end. What we realized in doing this was that there was, uh, we've talked a lot so far this week about kind of like SIP scale or mission scale product generation. There's a whole bunch of users that kind of sit a little bit further to the right of that. Um, where they don't have necessarily, you know, petabyte scale product generation problems, but ultimately they are pulling in some set of data from somewhere. They're trying to apply some set of transformations to it and they're producing some set of data. And so we started looking at, okay, how can we apply this in other places? So these were the goals we set out when we kicked off the idea of film drop, uh, bring your own data, open data, commercial data, all needed to be part of this. They were all part of uh, kind of the data sources that were coming in. Uh, we needed to be able to support developing your own algorithm. So that's your Jupyter Notebook kind of interface to this. I wanna be able to build an algorithm. I'm gonna do my analytics against it or BYO, um, BYO algorithm. So that's the case of, you know, you've got a PGE that you wanna run or something like that. We want to be able to go from raw packet level, so think AWS ground station, all the way up through higher level products, L1, L2, L3, et cetera. We need to be able to reprocess the archives because inevitably those algorithms are going to evolve. We need security. We needed analytics on top of it for machine language pipelining, pipelines, et cetera. All of that, all the stuff you would expect from the functional side. Architecturally, Stack had worked out really well for us. Um, it had been uh, rock solid for everything we had done before. It was moving at a pace we needed it to move. Um, and so we that leaned into that, we stayed with that. We wanted serverless um, as much as possible to minimize costs and maintenance issues. Uh, we needed it to be simple. That was one of the huge drivers. We just had to be easy to use, easy to deploy, et cetera. Uh, open, interoperable, everything you would expect. Um, on the business side, uh, again, going back to the small business thing, uh, we wanted to avoid building anything new that we didn't have to. So anywhere we could find a community that existed, an open source solution that existed, even if it wasn't a perfect fit, if we could contribute to it to move it to where we needed it to or to expand it to do what we needed it to do, that was a better solution than us kind of building from scratch. We needed a scalable security model, which really meant automate everything we possibly could, scaling up and down, SaaS offering, host self-hosted op options. And then this last one here, this mitigating vendor lock-in. So what's a little different than this and how we traditionally talk about it is we're the vendor here. So if we're working with commercial satellite operators or um, you pick your agency nonprofits and they're building on top of the solution, it would be an unacceptable business risk for them to rely on our existence and our continued maintenance of this uh, in order for them to function. And so we needed to approach this whole thing in a way that we could mitigate their vendor lock-in concerns with us. And that drove also to open sourcing this. It's kind of a, a side effect of, of, uh, of what we got there. At a high level component perspective or high level functional perspective, what we have is this idea of film drop core. That's what you would expect. Our ingest, our archive, data management, discovery, remote sensing data it supports the formats we've talked about, net CDF, HDF, COGS, czar, et cetera. Um, we support the analytics layered on top of it, uh, metadata generation and so on. The next one over, it's a little out of scope for this week, but I wanted to mention it, film drop DR. This is disaster response. Since we could scale up and down, we could scale down hardware wise and we could put this onto a snowball edge, AWS snowball edge or a snow cone, which means we could deploy it into the field. So now think we can have a deployable processing stack, geospatial processing stack in situ. So think drone data, we can do orthorectification of drone data, we can do compositing, we can do digital surface model uh, development, we could do data triage by running uh, models, trained models on the edge, like doing inference on the edge and actually prioritize data as it's being collected from a drone for surface for use in a disaster response capacity. Far to the right, you've got user the film drop UI, film drop analytics, that's what you'd expect, visualization, um, and then kind of the programmatic interface I mentioned before, which is based on Jupyter. Uh, architecturally, I'm, I'll own this, it's not terribly exciting. Uh, we have a tasking API, um, which we can back by either AWS ground station or commercial satellite tasking. Um, that gives us access to our level zero data. We can archive that off if we need to. Level zero data runs through one or more workflows, which produces the L1, L2, and so on up to higher level products. In the course of doing that, we're producing stack metadata, which goes into our metadata repository. We have the overall geospatial data lake that gets created with the actual holdings. Wrapping around that is our access and entitlements API. And all of that is ultimately done by some user uh, logging into something. I show Cognito on the screen here, but um, whether that could be Octo or whatever your kind of single sign-on of, of choice is uh, to get to this data. All right, now let's get to the interesting parts here, kind of diving in a little bit more. So open source underlying this, it's going to be all of the favorites that, you know, we've talked about kind of all week. Um, I have Stack Star here, right? So I'll talk a little about Stack in a second. I'll come back to that. X-Ray, Open Data Cube, Dask, Jupyter, Elasticsearch. We're moving to open search with a new, new release. 
Docker, GDAL, and then Cirrus is uh, the name of basically the workflow of pieces that we have open sourced out from underneath of this to take it out there. Basically, everything in FilmDrop is open sourced with the exception of our operational components. And I'll talk about that in a second. Um, I want to hit stack for a second because this comes up a lot when, and in fact, I saw it made it on the agenda as Element 84 stack. Uh, so we leverage stack um, all over the place. Stack is made up of really two kind of fundamental pieces. There's the metadata specification. That's this, right? The spatial temporal asset catalogs. There's a catalog within a catalog. You have collections within collections. You have items. There are extensions that then can be layered on top of this to expand out for, you know, band information or um, uh, projection information and so on. Like these are all kind of extensions that are layered on top of it. The other piece of stack is this idea of stack API. So there is a spec for what that API should look like. There are also sample implementations. We use Stack Server as one of ours, but there's uh, PyStack and FastStack, and there's a whole bunch of other implementations of this API. But one of the key things that Stack gets us is that a static file sitting on disk, so static Stack metadata record catalog sitting on disk, looks exactly the same as you would get back from this API, which means that for us, as we're producing for customers, potentially small data catalogs, they don't need to stand up an infrastructure to surface that. They can put it in an S3 bucket, expose it to the world, and anybody who can speak stack can hit that stack catalog sitting next to their data and use it just like any other system that they'd be hitting. Um, and so it allows for the more scalable ones, if you want full search capabilities and so on, you stand up an API. If you just want um, the, uh, if you just need to surface your data, you can drop a static catalog and uh, there's no kind of infrastructure you need to maintain it. Um, hitting a couple key points on our implementation and deployment experience. Um, we use public GitHub repositories for almost everything. The only thing we don't is our actual deployment, the operational deployment pieces, basically your infrastructure as code that is in a separate project. It is in a separate repository. It is not hosted on GitHub. It is hosted internally, and that's for security purposes. And that kind of lets us separate out the configuration and the deployment information from kind of what would normally go out in open source, and we don't have to kind of worry about those commingling. From a processing perspective, we can really use anything AWS makes available to us, EC2, including the spot market, Lambda, Fargate, Batch, we use step functions for orchestration. Um, and then uh, we wrap the actual processing code, the PGEs, if you will, uh, in containers. We provide a container base image that provides the hooks that we need to be able to invoke it. And then um, that help. And then folks who have the, the bring your own algorithm, they can just wrap it themselves and, uh, and deploy containers that way. Um, we inverted the Cirrus dependency. Uh, and what that means is the first time that we built this, the first version of Cirrus that we had in here was built with kind of extension points and you would build out of that. And what we found was in practice, that meant we ended up having to fork it all the time as the customer got more sophisticated. And so what we did instead was we flipped this over and we turned Cirrus into a library and we turned it into a dependency. And so what you would do now when you want to create a deployment of this, you clone the repository, you run the Cirrus command line and it will create a configuration file and add Cirrus lib as a dependency to that project. You now focus on building workflows and the services that Cirrus lib makes available. If you want to upgrade or anything like that, you just change the version number and the new Cirrus lib comes along. And it's deliberately inverted from kind of the traditional model. Um, and that lets us, it makes it much easier for us to maintain it in the open source world without having to fork it. Multi-cloud support kind of goes along with this. It's complicated. Um, one of the things we talk a lot about software moving between clouds and vendor lock-in there, I'm far more concerned about data lock-in. Um, if what the data you want to use is sitting in Azure, Microsoft Azure, and your stuff and the other product you're using is sitting in AWS, you've got a problem. So we approach this by doing um, custom implementations for each library for each cloud provider, like a Cirrus Lib AWS, Cirrus Lib Azure, and basically we rely on kind of the expected interfaces that uh, the workflow has available to it. And then we can map it to the provider's specific features and scale it that way. Uh, I'd be honest, I don't know if it's going to work. Uh, it works now. I don't know if it's going to scale well, but uh, this is what we're doing. Um, security, I mentioned, um, as, uh, as Sean mentioned earlier, CICD pipeline, this is critical for us. Um, so we have automate, you know, review re requirements for merges, depending on what branch you're pulling into, automated license scanning, CVEs, dependency scanning, et cetera. All of that you would expect as part of our CICD pipeline. Um, in terms of mapping natively into a cloud infrastructure. So the way we do this is within it, you have this idea of a workflow, that's your processing steps. And within that, you have this idea of a task and those tasks are the individual steps. 
we can configure a task to indicate what level of CPU, GPU, and memory we need, which means that we can then provision the appropriate set of resources for a single step within a workflow. So if the first step of your workflow is a massive amount of compute, we can provide massive instances for that. If the next step is then some metadata generation, we can scale it way back down and pull into a smaller instance size. Storage is similar. If you can tolerate, except it's based on latency and distributed processing needs, if you can tolerate latency, we're going to keep you in S3 and we'll use the data there. If you need SSD level performance attached to the instance, then we pull in EBS volumes attached to your instance as we spin them up. If you can parallelize and we can do uh, multiple nodes banging on the same set of data, we we'll use a distributed file system like EFS and make that available. Put all of this together with serverless and what this means is that there are no compute instances running unless we're actually processing data. The entire infrastructure spins down. There are no instances running 24 seven to maintain pipeline capacity. It is fully serverless until data shows up in a bucket. When that data shows up in a bucket, messages get queued and then instances get spun up and we can do instance warming and everything else for throughput purposes if we need to. All right, lessons uh, two, learned. Two, two minutes, Dan. Perfect, okay, cool, thank you. All right, lessons learned. First one is everyone's a data producer. So really we talk about this in terms of data production and everything else and downstream users and all this other thing. Really the question, um, the way that we've come to think about it is basically, are you a data expander or a data reducer? But anyway, you look at it. If, so for example, if you're on the left side of this graph, if you're a mission, you're taking level zero data and you're producing level one, level two, level three, pro likely multiple products and so on. If you're on the far right side of this graph, if you're an information you know, an applied scientist or, um, or even further removed, you need a higher level of abstraction that data. You're not looking at doing phase unwrapping of data, um, but you're probably using multiple products and collapsing them down to some higher level thing that produces the information that you're interested in. But everyone is a data producer. Corollary to that is then someone cares about your intermediate data or you should care about theirs, which gets back to the whole stack thing I mentioned where you can have these intermediate catalogs, these archives of convenience, if you've ever heard me go on that rant, um, that we can create and make available and surface. Um, other major thing I want to hit here is kind of from a community perspective. This is a slide showing kind of the stack status, number of contributors, number of public catalogs, number of extensions, et cetera. This is just a logo slide of organizations involved in the stack community. And I'm putting this in here because I think it is so important to differentiate between the idea of open source, where I'm just going to kind of throw my code out there and hope someone uses it versus an open source community that you can plug into, engage with, um, and help grow, or you have to kind of do that yourself. And I don't think all open source is is uh, is equivalent and, and equal. And so bearing this in mind is important. Um, this slide is courtesy of Fernando from earlier. Uh, he said it better than I did. Uh, so I, I got his approval to actually include this slide. I think your know, people, ideas, tools, and stories. That tools piece is not the end of the open source approach. It is a, it's a necessary component, but it is not the end all be all. Um, that's really all I have. Uh, there's a couple other slides in the deck, um, but uh, this is, that's it. Excellent. Thank you, Dan. Uh, very nicely okay. done. Uh, it's a lot of material and great presentation. Uh, so I do want to announce we are going to take a, make a quick change to our agenda. We were planning on going into a break, but we think it, it makes more sense to have the Q&A led by the System Architecture Working Group uh, team uh, just following this while everyone's here and the, the presentation is there. So I'm going to turn it over to Elias Safi and Natasha Stavros. Thanks, Luke. And that was a a really cool set of presentations we saw with a lot of information. There's sort of three types of questions that we're going to ask, and I'll start with the first set here. Uh, and I'll address it to specific folks, but that similar type of question will come to the rest of you, so please be ready for it. Uh, first question here was for Tyson. Uh, it sounds like when you presented Cybers, there's two modes. There's one is sort of a managed service with a backend infrastructure, and another one is uh, you can take the, the software and deploy that somewhere else to wherever your environment is. Uh, has Cybers been used in the in the context of a flight mission uh, to do systematic processing and you know data production at that level? Yeah. Um, so yeah, Cy Cybers um, can be used a lot of different ways. It's you know the, the platform is all there and, and we can leverage it however we want. Um, <clears throat> so in in my personal research, I fly drones and I work with lidar data and I work with Planet Labs data. And so we've, we've set up some processing pipelines for processing our drone data um, and then, you know, putting that into Earth Engine or doing some inner comparison stuff with LiDAR data. So, yes, we have a lot of users, we have a lot of use cases. Um, and 
I, I didn't say it, but we try to take a Lego block approach to everything. So we have all these different Legos. And when we have a use case come in, we build their workflow or their pipeline out as they need it. I see. Do you know of any specific Earth missions that have used uh, this within the context of systematic processing? No, I don't think we've, we have not been processing satellite data um, for any EOS platforms per se. It's like I said, Cyrus is set up for plant genomics. So we have a lot of genomic stuff. We have, I, I suppose we do have just modeling things from um, the Southern Oceans project. There's some modeling data that we're holding for them. Um, but I, I'm not sure if that was uh, using satellite imagery. I think it was mostly just models. Yep. I think the, the, the sort of the area where the majority of users and not just your system, but Pangeo and, and um, other things that were presented here, uh, they're really sort of uh, analysis platforms for science users. And, and so the question is not meant to sort of derive from that. We understand that use case is trying to apply it to how we can use it within this study. Um, so thank you for that. Uh, similar question uh, for Joe on Pangeo, and I'll start with the, the first part is, uh, does Pangeo also offer a managed service similar to Cyverse where there's an infrastructure, you just come in and use it, or is it really just a software suite and you've got to deploy it in your own system? Yeah, it's an interesting question. I mean, as a open source project that is like loosely connected, like we, we have deployed infrastructure that is available for community use. Um, so there are Jupyter hubs and, you know, the Pangeo Forge example is maybe the closest thing to like an operational system, but, you know, it's important, I think, to realize that most of the like core activities in the Pangeo project have been ephemeral in the sense that they're funded by like, you know, two to three or four year grants. Um, so, you know, we haven't been building them into, say, an operational system in that way. Now, the components of the system have absolutely been employed in operational systems. I think, you know, Dan's example of using X-Ray and Dask and Stack is a good one that you know those the the tools that we that kind of Pangeo is built on and has been um, working to integrate have have made their way into a lot of operational systems and you know I know that uh, you know uh, folks on the in the in the NiceR space are using some of these tools and so the processing pipelines that are being built at at DAX and elsewhere um, are are using elements of this um, but yeah, the, the like. The traditional, like, what is a Pangeo deployment on Kubernetes? I don't know of a operational system that's using that, um, but all the in underlying pieces, yes, absolutely. Yep, no, totally understood. I, I think you, you hit that nail on the head. It, it really is a set of software. There are implementations. There are certain uh, aspects of it being deployed, but that's not necessarily where it has been. Uh, similar question in terms of uh, any uh, any examples of. Earth mission, NASA data, uh, within the context of mission data processing systems and you know forward processing and bulk reprocessing that, that you know of kind of being used, or has it been more in the area of the sort of study focused and data analysis? I think I know the answer to it, but I don't know if you have any examples of, of it used within that realm. Yeah, so I <clears throat> excuse me, I don't have a, a long list of um, the processing chains, but I know that you know we've had interactions with folks at say DAX that are using these tools. So I think the answer is yes, but I don't have a good catalog for you. The most vocal participants in the Pangeo community are in or closer to the end user side of the spectrum, um, which would it would actually be great if we knew more about you know the folks at DAX that are building operational systems that are using the underlying tools and like what the problems they're running into. And if, if like we could get one thing out of this um, would be to encourage more um, interaction um, from the community that does more operational tool building um, with the develop, development, like the open source development community. Yeah, yeah and actually it's, it's even further up the chain from the DAX. This is the, the data processing system which feeds the DAX. Yeah. So um, it would be interesting to see what that looks like. Um, moving on, next question was for Sean. Uh, it sounds like the platform, it, the first question, is, is this a platform that's deployed on sort of the classified missions and government work that you were showing? Uh, there's really two, two systems kind of embedded in what I was talking about. Um, the Forge uh, system uh, definitely has to operate at a higher classification level because of the nature of their mission. Okay. 
Um, and, you know, that's one of the challenges we're looking at is uh, how, what, you know, the community I think is looking at is, is how to get access to that data. Cause certainly the raw data itself, uh, there, there could be some, some things that they don't want to have go out. And so there has to be some level of processing that happens before you can release it into the open. Uh, but certainly for the wildfires right. example I gave, uh, that, that would need to be uh, uh, made more streamlined. The, the other example I gave yeah, was it, JPSS. It, 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 sorry, is, that so, is the software available as open source? I would say the the forge platform itself that I, you know the part that I was talking about uh, we would be able to to make some sort of a solution similar to that be be open source. Okay, um, I see, but it's not an open source project at this point. That's correct. Yeah, I think if is it correct to state that what you showed was sort of capabilities that, that that are available and that can be deployed and built for customers, right? It wasn't necessarily a set of tools and software that people can download and install and deploy themselves or a managed service. Correct. Yeah. All right, thank you. Uh, yeah. And then one question for Dan here on the uh, sort of, you know, you obviously mentioned that this is a lot of open source software. Uh, is there also a managed service along with the software? Uh, or is it is it really just the software and it's deployed, um, you know, as an instance for for different users? Uh, it is uh, okay. So both of those. It is not a multi-tenant system. Um, so yeah, okay. even when we're so we will provide, we will host and manage an instance if the customer does not want to do it themselves. So that's kind of it. So it's not SaaS in the like go here, enter your credit card number, and we spin an instance up for them. Um, uh, funny enough, that was actually how we initially started this. We were actually looking at going, uh, talking to universities and whatnot that were doing kind of CubeSat work and, uh, to kind of make it as, you know, click here, we'll spin up an instance for you and tear it back down at the end of, you know, the semester. Um, the uptake hasn't really been there. So there are instances that we manage, um, but it's not quite SaaS in the sense of, um, you know, there's no human in the loop. Um, what we found is basically everybody needed some level of help of onboarding, whether it's their data or pulling data from other places or onboarding their algorithms or something like that. And so a really truly um, uh, enter your credit card number managed service just wasn't going to fly. We, we needed to be involved somewhere in that loop. But we do host and provide 24-7 ops for, uh, for some of our customers. I see. And you've also mentioned that it's available as an open source product, right? The majority yep. of it, I know there's certain specific pieces. Uh, are there instances of folks that have done that, taken that software and then deployed it and used it? I don't know. Um, I don't know that I could, uh, because generally the folks that have touched it have talked to us in some capacity. So I don't know. There are some where, some where we can help bootstrap them and get them going and then they will go off with it. Um, but I don't know whether, I couldn't tell you if anybody has just straight up deployed their own instance and didn't talk to us about it at all. I'm not sure. Okay. All right, thank you for that. Mm -hmm. uh, the next sort of questions that we had um, centered around cost sharing and cost tracking, uh, and that obviously applies a little bit more to the systems that have a, a managed service. Uh, I think uh, Cyverse in that sense uh, seemed to apply, and, and I would say that the, um, the work that Kirk is doing uh, up in ASF as well. So maybe the questions would be geared a little bit towards that. Um, so the, the, you know, the first question, Tyson. So the, the, ac the accessible platform part, uh, it's how are costs tracked across that with multiple users or organizations using your managed service portion of this? Uh, or is that, is that even a capability within the system? So, so our systems, we host all of our own um, core systems. Um, so we've got tens of thousands of cores online for running jobs within our infrastructure. We mostly run our jobs through Exceed, which is the NSF supercomputer framework, and then the open science grid. And those come um, either directly through allocations that individual researchers obtain um, through those organizations. Our partnerships that we've run through AWS um, and other commercial cloud providers, those, those costs are burdened by those partners. So we we can run the platform in commercial cloud, but for the most part, we are, we do what I think most people do is just find the cheapest or the freest compute for all of our jobs. And because we're, we're supported fully by the, the NSF, we're able to leverage the exceed and the OSG in that way. I see. So, so 
say I'm an individual, uh, you know, uh, person leading a, a study or research, and I need to do something, and I come to you and I say I want to use your system. Do I have to? Do I come with a credit card? Do I have to already it's, come with no, money and some kind free. of funding? So, yeah, up to we we give every user 100 uh, gigs of free service, and we'll go up to 10 terabytes uh, for individual users in our data store. The, the compute is dependent upon your project, but you can find that either within our infrastructure or on um, our, our cloud resources through Jetstream. Um, when you go beyond 10 terabytes, we usually uh, go into an agreement with someone about um, some kind of either uh, purchasing of new servers or uh, cost per terabyte per year. And so we have agreements with specific projects I that are larger. That. Got it. And, and then you sort of extend the same thing to if they need to use AWS services or right. cloud services. Right. As so well. if, it's, if it's a private company okay. or a private deployment, then they manage their own costs. And that will be changing um, in the next okay. couple of years. Thank you. Uh, similar question for uh, Kirk there on the ASF platform. Uh, you know, obviously, this is meant for many users as far as the managed service. How are costs managed and, and then allocated to different users? Uh, or is it all, is the cost all just covered by ASF? So for- This is both uh, storage and processing. Right, yeah. Uh, for for a, a large user that wants to do sort of a large scale processing or, or, or use OpenStar Lab for a, a lot of um, students or for a class or a lot of collaborators, will uh, deploy into a separate AWS account because that's the cleanest way to have the costs in a separate. So we'll do a, a completely separate deployment of, of both systems or, or either system and then just, um, that the bill for that AWS account is passed on straight to the user. Uh, for smaller scale users, um, we'll use the multi-tenant approach and have, uh, and then through tagging, you know, so that the, the um, instance volumes that are being used by the user in OpenStar Lab or the, the processing instances that are fired up um, in the hype system are tagged and then, the, and then we're billed and then users build um, you know, using that information. The, the tagging in AWS is a little bit, um, you know, not as, as uh, maybe reliable as we would like it to be. There's a lot of you know, overhead costs that we're not always passing on. And so that's kind of um, you know, actively being discussed how to better handle that. Um, but that's what we're doing right now. I see. And then sort of the system maintenance itself, how is that cost covered? So well, there's a little it, bit it of like- It isn't just the use, right? It isn't just the, the processing and storage that costs money, but the services and the people and and the software maintenance, it is that shared cost as well? Yeah, we're, there's a little bit of discussion there too. What's the right amount to charge somebody just for the overhead of keeping the system running and managing it? Because uh, because right now all of the instances are managed by ASF. The, the, the code is all open. And so somebody could you know, grab it and stand up an instance of OpenStar Lab themselves. And I don't think that's happened. And I know that has not happened, but the, the Hype system um, has been installed, I think by another uh, agency and they've been using it to some success. But anyway, to answer your question, um, the, the the overhead costs are, are are still evolving. I guess where there's a sort of a flat charge that we have now that okay, it's going to cost you know X dollars plus usage is what we're doing to cover that. But that still needs to be fine tuned. I think. Yeah. Yep. I just uh, uh, give a brief two, two minute warning, Elias. Thank you. Okay, we do have one more set of questions, and I know uh, some of these cost questions are kind of on the edges of things, but this is what also will help the team here uh, in terms of an architecture. Uh, moving on to the next set of questions, which is sort of challenges in the long term sustainability. Uh, and I know this, this question is addressed to one person, but I'll just address it to um, sort of the panel here, and maybe I'll go one by one. Uh, what do you see as the biggest barriers uh, to users using your platform? Uh, and let's start with Dan. And how are you working to accommodate those challenges? Yeah, so uh, for us, the the biggest thing, and kind of gets to that graph I showed, like the kind of just the little curve there, is that um, it really you have to define the users. So, for example, if we're working with satellite operators, um, the challenges that they face, uh, kind of the 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 mission or the business risk that I mentioned earlier, and kind of mitigating the vendor lock-in risk. Uh, scalability, et cetera, those are, those are the risks or the challenges that they deal with and how do they produce their data fast enough? How do they have, what are their, their sales model for their data? How do they recoup their costs in terms of getting their data out there and are they producing the right products? Um, at the other end of the spectrum, it's a different class of users and they are looking at, here's the information I need because I need to apply it to the domain I'm trying to work in. And so they will frequently have challenges around 
Um, sometimes they're buying commercial data, they have subscriptions to commercial data, uh, or they don't even know that the product exists in an open sense. Um, or kind of what are cost controls around that. So for example, we've done things around tipping and queuing where we will use an open product for kind of global monitoring and then we'll turn that into a task request for commercial satellite for a high resolution piece. At the right hand side of that spectrum, that's kind of a that's a level of sophistication of data awareness and and kind of how to plug into that that they just don't have. So um it's, it varies um, depending on the user you're talking about. Uh, for us, our next step is on the on the satellite provider, the operator side, um, how do we help them build their workflows in a way that they can test them and then we can bring them to scale more quickly? Like what logs do you expose? What information? How do you debug uh, workflows that are running at large scale in, in the cloud um, and giving them the right access to be able to do it? At the other end of the spectrum, how do we give people access to the data in a way that's meaningful for them and a, and a user interface they can see and present that data in a useful way? Those are the two challenges we're kind of working on in parallel. Yep, thank you. I know we're running short on time, but I'll try and, and, and go up. Uh, Joe, for you as well, uh, what are the biggest barriers to using your platform? Uh, yeah, you know, I think there's there's maybe two. I think access, long, like, um, uh, yeah, sustained access to the tools we're building. I, I think in many ways, Pangeo has been a sandbox for developing new ideas. And so I think there's been like a number of folks that have come forward and said, hey, this is great. I really love this, but like, how do I adopt this for my five-year project when you say this is all, like, you got a big warning that says this is, um, you know, experimental. Uh, and so, you know, as an open source project, that's a challenge, but, you know, looking in the chat, like there's multiple groups now that are running the Pangeo stack um, in a ma in managed services at NASA. There's, uh, you know, a nonprofit called 2i2c that is doing this. And so I think we're starting to see some solutions in this space, but that's been one of the main, main pain points. I think over the project as a whole, though, the idea of an open source community is that, you know, you can take out any one, you know, person or even a group of people. And like, if the idea is still useful to people, the open source community can fill in that space. So maybe not on the services side, but on the, on the component technologies, I think we're actually really well positioned for sustainable support, just based on our, the community nature of the project. Uh, and, and Tyson as well in terms of cyber. Sorry, Luke. Uh, I think I had in my slides, it's training new users. So yeah. we, we have a community of graduate students out there that don't know about GitHub, don't know about containers, and don't know about reproducible research. Uh, and, and Kirk, I, I think you don't have that funding challenge, obviously, as a DAC, so you do have dedicated funding for this. But uh, what are the biggest barriers to using the system, and, and how are you uh, meeting those challenges or trying to accommodate those challenges? Yeah, for us, it's similar to what Joe said, you know, it's access. We, right now, Open Star Lab is not a fully open system to all users, which we really want to change, but, you know, that's not realistic right now with the level of funding, uh, you know, for the, for the platform. We'd like to, you know, make it a, a, a fully open and fully accessible by all um, people, people experiment and do different things, but that's not possible right now. The other thing is, um, is the engineering that it takes to go from a, you know, mature science algorithm to, you know, containerized, you know, at scale processing. There's a little more engineering, you know, plumbing that needs to be done now that I think we would ideally like. It, it should be a, and it's never going to be a, you know, click the easy button and have it happen. But um, we would like to um, facilitate that in in some way. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I would address that to Sean, but I, I think you mentioned this is not a like managed service. So I'm not sure how the question would fly. Um, thank you all. We'll turn it over to Luke for our break. Yeah. I just wanted to, 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 again, thank all of our speakers. Excellent presentations, very informative. Uh, really, really happy to have your participation. I hope you can stick around. Uh, let's turn it over to a 15 minute break. Uh, we'll put up the slides to return back. And uh, again, thank you. All right, well, why don't we, um, why don't we resume our sessions? Uh, so welcome back everyone. Uh, I'd like to go ahead and get started again, try and stick to our schedule on this Friday uh, near the afternoon here. So um, we're going to resume uh, under the same uh, theme of the other big data processing system architectures. Uh, our first speaker um, coming up now is Dan McQuan from Red Hat. Dan is the chief, pardon me. Um, Dan is the chief strategist for space and science at Red Hat. 
He has over a decade of experience at Red Hat working with the civilian government scientific entities from NASA and DOE to NOAA and NIH. His area of expertise is helping scientific agencies leverage bleeding edge open source technologies in a sustainable and secure fashion across the myriad infrastructure types, HPC, edge, on-premise, Kubernetes, and both public and hybrid cloud environments. So Dan, thank you very much. Please take it away. Oh, you're, uh, we can't hear you. <laughs> Sorry. It's my fault. No worries. I did, I did the, uh, okay. I did the, uh, the checkbox thing again. I apologize. Can you hear me now? We can hear you now. All right, great. Give me this one more second. It's that little pesky share tab audio in the bottom left that always gets you, right? Right. Yep, we can see your slides. Presenter view is loaded. Go ahead. Are we there? Thanks, Dan. We are. All right, great. Cool. <clears throat> thank you very much, Luke. And thank you to the whole uh, OSSI uh, task force and leadership group. Uh, very thankful to be presenting to all of you today. Uh, and then also to the, all the other presenters. It's just so wonderful to see uh, you know, the proliferation of open source and you know, scientific tooling. It, I know it's nothing new for, for all of y'all. Uh, and certainly not for us either. Um, and I thought that maybe I would take a little bit of a different tack here rather than talk about you know, speeds and feeds and capabilities. Uh, I, I, I would imagine or gather that, that there isn't a, a NASA scientist or collaborator that isn't using uh, Red Hat technology in some context, whether it's like our upstream stuff, whether you have something like Fedora, you know, or just like open, you know, you know full community-based uh, open source technology uh, at, this, at this time. So I thought that rather than talk about like, oh, let's talk about how Red Hat OpenShift and our Kubernetes dis you know, distribution is better than somebody else's. Like that, that's not productive in my mind uh, because you know, in the conversations I've had with you know, uh, NASA leadership, uh, especially around the open source science initiative, I would talk a little bit more, I think it's a little more valuable to talk about uh, the methodology that we use, uh, what I believe to be at least from my observation, something that would be appropriate to consider uh, as far as uh, OSSI collaborators are concerned, and like philosophically why that makes sense um, moving forward. So, let's see, you've got next slide. There we go. So uh, I don't think it, it's it's a stretch, like I said, to 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 be touching Red Hat tech or you know upstream versions of Red Hat tech uh, across the centers. We've been doing this a long time. I've been here for over ten years, uh, working with all the laboratories on the DOE side all the flight centers. Uh, and these are only the logos that my legal let me use because these are the ones that are publicly referenceable, but uh, you know, naturally there's a handful of our stuff you know, in other places. But you know, I think that the, the notion of open source technology in science uh, is one that is well established. I mean, there's just not a lot of you know, COTS proprietary software tools out there that can meet mission where um, mission demands uh, emerging technologies. And that the crucibles of that type of development is naturally in you know, upstream open source communities. Uh, in case in point, a lot of the presenters today are talking about you know, Jupiter and Spark and PyTorch and you know, the things that have kind of, kind of risen to the, the top of the data science tools you know, in the open source communities. And naturally, we are going to take advantage of, of those you know, really big, burgeoning, high impact community developed software tools you know, in our products when we productize them, right? That's, not really it, the, the core of the conversation uh, on my side, because I think that's relatively understood, but perhaps how we do it is not as understood. Uh, so we don't own any tech. We don't create any tech behind the wall. We don't take upstream technologies and then bring them in-house, package them with you know, our code and then ship it. Uh, that's not how it works. Uh, we, we participate in thousands of upstream communities. Uh, on a day-to-day -day basis, and all of our engineers are actively banging code and pushing it to the upstream community. We, we don't do it internally. We're doing everything free and open and on the outside. So that's like the, the, the primary, um, you know, enterprise, you know, development methodology for Red Hat as far as we consider open source communities to be the crucible of, you know, how we get to what we consider products. And ultimately it begins with participation. And there's this massive galaxy of open source projects, and you know, many of which we play a leading role in developing, like Linux kernel, uh, KVM, Cryo, Kubernetes, and a bunch of the Kubernetes SIGs. 
Uh, we've been long collaborators with NASA actually on OpenStack after OpenStack was uh, you know, open sourced you know, from the, the Nebula project out at Ames and you know, trying to find ways to get the, the best of breed capabilities from the upstream into an enterprise supportable product, right? That is you know, stable and you know, consumable, reliable, and then also meeting all the various you know, specifications for security behind the wall, or if you're running it you know, in, a, in a hyperscale provider. So that's, that's how we do it. Now, I think that there is an interesting element of, you know, certainly what I've come to understand from the OSSI initiative, uh, especially when it comes to tooling and making available, you know, uh, uh, you know, all the information out of the DAX and so on and so forth, so that people can do more science faster, where it almost seems like part of the procedure ought to be running this same process, but kind of in reverse. And I say that because there are NASA developed or collaborator developed tools that are you know, used widely across the NASA enterprise. You have varying flight centers. Uh, I think a good example of this is the stuff say at like uh, at Johnson Space Center with like Trick and Trick HLA and Doug, where there are well-established user communities for this technology. And then you know the, there's not really a common dev environment for it. There's no really consolidated platform. It's just like here's the here's the, the software stack that's going to do the thing you need to do. Take it and go. And that's not necessarily like as open sourcey as I think the OSSI is trying to accomplish. So you know, for, you know philosophically speaking, it's like how do we run this backwards? Like well let's identify the technology that makes the most sense to attempt to build a community around and then go backwards with it. It's, we've done that when we bought companies that got proprietary code, like I'm sure everybody's familiar with Ansible. They had like the management console. That's what you paid for. We open source that entire technology, something called AWX. It's used all over NASA, it, you know, wonderful process, but determining what is important to open source and how to build a community around it is like super important because you, you do have to you know be mindful of the community development environment there's a lot of folks today we're talking about using git or git ops as a mechanism for code control and code promotion but then there's a governance you know um you know, a facet to have to be concerned with. And like, how does the government, your government agency do open source governance, you know, especially across, you know, non-homogenous compute environments is a homogenous compute environment, you know, kind of consisting of non-homogenous hardware and storage volumes uh, makes sense. And so again, trying to establish precedent and procedure around doing this, this very large agency-wide initiative kind of out of step with what we see is you know one very interesting for us because we love to see you know nerdy tech really really cool interesting profoundly valuable technology be part of these you know self-sustaining uh communities uh with collaborators from around the world and i think that it's kind of unique to the scientific space that such a thing can even happen right because it's you know uh, understandably and kind of primitively like you know, we have to interact with you know multiple agencies and you know research institutions around the world. Uh, you know, as a result of producing scientific data and scientific information, which is kind of what, in my mind, a lot of this is all about, right? We want to like decrease the amount of time, like decrease the time for the mean time of science. Like, how do we do more science faster? And so, you know, naturally, you've got the infrastructure underneath it, wherever you want to run it. The, just now in the Q&A session, we're talking about pricing models, as a service delivery, um, complexity and sophistication of operation, things of that nature. Certainly something that needs to be managed, right? But the thing that I heard over and over again from uh, the earlier presenters today, um, especially uh, with, with Dan when I joined up at the call 1230 uh, Eastern time here, is how do you get the prototyping done fast, right? Like how does the testing of the capabilities, you know, in an iterative and like basically never ending process create the mechanism for us to reuse existing data products? Uh, and, you know, case in point, I was at uh, Oak Ridge this past week. I was there on Wednesday. Yeah, Wednesday this week. And uh, we're talking about like the delivery of their new supercompute system, Frontier. It's adjacency to... Um, to summit right to the power box and like how do they intend to get these machines to to kind of you know collaborate even as contextually and the 
resounding results I got was like, we have this data issue where we've got tons and tons of scientific information that's been created across this massive, you know, file system. It's like seven, 800 PB or something like that. Not, I mean, structured, but you know, finding the information is difficult. And then you know, trying to make adjacent to the net new applications that are leveraging, you know, the Jupiters and the Sparks and the Pi torches of the world, give them that adjacency to all of these, you know, existing data products to create new data products, right? So like, it's like science on science with a net new application infrastructure that allows for and permits for um, a reinvestigation of existing scientific data that can bring different types of information together and then provide a new vector you know, for research, which is you know, really, uh, really interesting. And quite frankly, uh, a conversation I have uh, quite a bit across the DOE lab complex and uh, with leadership across the other flight centers. So, uh, and of course, with the other um, uh, uh, speakers today it seems it's something that's very well understood in this crowd and what we you know like to be able to to articulate is that you know ultimately the open source stack really shouldn't care like it shouldn't matter where it runs it should run the same every time uh and if you're going to be you know developing an open source ecosystem or multiple open source ecosystems around tool uh tool chip tool chains toolkits uh application stacks <clears throat> that having a you know a a commonality and expectation uh of data production is super important uh especially when it comes to reproducibility uh hence a lot of the folks talking today talk about containers are super important so um modern application development uh, you just kind of, again, philo philosophically, uh, you know, there's, there's you know, a handful of development you know, practices for success. Uh, there was a conversation, I believe it was the Raytheon folks were talking about DevSecOps isn't necessarily the appropriate procedure for, you know, let's say like orbiting instrumentation, like you're not going to be changing the software stack on the instrument, right, very often. And the data stream is relatively predictable. So how do we do new and nerdy and cool things on the ground with that information? And you know, I think you know, the scientific community and government is probably the most domain-driven design-centric organizations you know, uh, you know, in the cabinet, of all the cabinet level agencies, because it has to be, right? Um, I mean, you look at, you, know, and you pick any flight center out, you've got Goddard, I mean, the, uh, during uh, workshop one, we we're talking with the heliophysics group, and then we we're talking with the climatology group, like side by side, trying to solve some of the same problems, but with different instrumentation, different tools, and you know, different infrastructures, and, you know, and, and you know, different componentry. Uh, and then we've talked about test driven development across the board, like these are super important things to be mindful of. I mean, is it really CI CD? Is it really DevSecOps? Does it really matter? Um, not necessarily, uh, because, you know, the, the stack of tools that are being used to create the capabilities for like the big data you know, type of uh, uh, procedures that are being implemented you know, across the varying centers and, you know, with the pre existing data from all the DACs. Uh, does require, you know, these modern development languages and frameworks. Like that's very, you know, I think, again, a lot of folks here understand it. But the hard part is, is when you're trying to build from scratch, like how much of this stuff do you want to maintain? Um, especially if it's going to exist on a government network and, you know, like, are you going to introduce, you know, security vulnerabilities and all this other stuff? Because, um, you know, as far as all the components that are you know, available uh, in the data science world, you know, cloud native, you know, app dev, uh, or even, you know, big data, um, you know, capabilities, it's a very large ecosystem. Uh, as you can see on this slide, uh, this is the map of all of the cloud native components that are you know, able to be chosen from in order to run, you know, uh, you know data science or containers in production. And this is the uh, Cloud Native Computing Foundations. You know, you know this is their slide. This is what the, what they uh, they manage. Uh, you know, they're, it's the same governing body that was home to Kubernetes, uh, which was actually their first project, and it covers everything from like you know, infrastructure and app services, developer services, observability tools, you know, languages and frameworks and all that stuff. And this is not something I think that the government wants to be in the business of maintaining. Right, um, like trying to bring all the capabilities to bear, you know, behind the wall or you know, in a blended model uh, on a hyperscale environment. Um, trying to be the steward of all of this is exceptionally difficult and increases, you know, the blast radius uh, quite a bit. So, uh, and I know I'm running out of time here, so I'll get to the takeaway slide here. Um, so, without all that in, in mind, 
when you understand how Red Hat builds technology from open source community to what we productize, and then that there's already really interesting uh, and very necessary, even mission critical capabilities that are you know inside of NASA that could benefit from being open sourced if they aren't already, or you know living inside of uh, you know an open source framework inside of NASA so that. Um, the, the varying collaborators across the uh, the flight centers and you know, university institutions can you know, push code and and create um, you know you know better software faster um, is to build communities around the most important and impactful stuff and to very importantly rely on you know ISVs or hyperscalers for infrastructure like would not recommend uh, biting off more than you can chew because the more stuff that you try to aggregate you know as part of the community developed software uh, inside of, the, of uh, OSSI is going to increase the blast radius for any number of things that can be very problematic. So certainly wouldn't recommend that. And then most importantly, and this is kind of like at you know, uh, Kevin Murphy's level and you know, his peers and, and his deputies, is to uh, attempt to determine procedures for community governance and stewardship. Uh, it's crucially important. And you know, we can learn from Red Hat's failures here. Uh, we had a capability that was called Red Hat Satellite Server, which was basically an update server for all your Linux across your environment that was built on a technology called Spacewalk, which was in the upstream. And after a number of years, uh, the only active contributors to Spacewalk were Red Hat employees, you know, banging code uh, up in the, in the uh, over the wall in the, in the open source community. And that is a, you know, a giant red flag for like, hey, maybe uh, this technology isn't as valuable in the open source world as we think it is. So we went and rebuilt the product around like the Puppet and Candlepin and, and a handful of other stuff uh, because it's more usable, more suitable for the client base at large. So. Uh, with that, uh, again, learn from our failures when you can. Uh, we are here to help uh, determine governance, uh, you know, for the folks that are interested in it, um, and to talk more uh, deeply if anyone is interested. And that means everybody, you know, all the all the other folks from, uh, you know, from from Raytheon and so forth, um, about you know how we can help, uh, uh, you know, facilitate a, a great outcome for uh, the open source science initiative. And with that, I'll kick it back. Thank you very much. Excellent. Thank you, Dan. A wonderful presentation. Please stick around for the Q&A uh, after the, the sessions. Of course. Thank you. All right. Um, up next, <clears throat> we have uh, representatives from Amazon Web Services, uh, Shane Hawthorne and Ben Snively. Uh, Shane's going to be taking lead on the presentation, I believe. Shane uh, has worked for over 30 years in the space field, first as an active duty and reserve U.S. Air Force astronautical engineer and space operations officer, building and launching uh, research and development satellites for the intelligence community, and conducting both space surveillance and counter space operations. Shane has also served 20 years at the MITRE Corporation as technical director on IC sensors, missile defense agency sensors, and engagement systems uh, and space control systems. He then joined AWS Region Services, where he founded AWS Ground Station, Amazon's first space service, and then joined AWS Aerospace and Satellite Solutions Division as the space technology leader. In, his, in this role, Shane leads a team of innovative engineers technical product managers and technical program managers who can work across AWS to develop new space services and features that disrupt how space uh, exploration, satellite, and launch operations are conducted. Uh, and also enable commercial and government-based customers to share, fuse, and leverage space data to improve their missions and products. Ben is, the principal solution, is a principal solutions architect with the AWS public sector data science uh, and a data science specialist. So take it away, Shane. Great, great. Thank you so much, Luke. And um, I'm going to bring up our share here and you guys let me know if everything works again, because <laughs> you never know, right? Um, but I just have to get here. Oh, shoot. See what I mean? Um, come on. There. Okay. You guys seeing our screen now there, Luke? Yep. Looks great. Sounds good. Excellent. Well, guy, that, that intro is so nice. Uh, let's put it a different way. Ben is the genius data scientist, and I'm just the dumb astronautical engineer who's done some space stuff. Uh, I'm coming to you guys from the Denver International Airport. I apologize that I had to uh, do it from here, but uh, happy to be uh, briefing to you guys today. So first off, we wanted to start uh, with the project goals and objectives. And so our goal and objective is to... Um, uh, enable the open science for JPL, provide to you guys the tools and architectures that allow you to reduce the data processing 
uh, cost and uh, work, enhance time to mission science, and uh, get things to you fast, and uh, enable you guys to really get closer to open science using AWS Cloud and like some of the great tools like from places like Red Hat and everybody else. Uh, the big constraint that we see is getting you connected to the cloud in all respects so that you can start to move from the kind of approach of we have data and we move that data to the compute, we, we, we move it to the engineers. And instead what we want to do is with the cloud, put you into the storage system on the AWS cloud, allow you to use our global network and then all the other services that are there so that you can actually bring the experts and the science to the, the storage. And that way you can actually uh, build off of some other use cases that we're gonna talk to in a minute. And you're gonna be able to hopefully get a lot more efficiencies and enable open science across your entire uh, portfolio of customers. So here's an architecture I'd like to really emphasize. Start in the upper left, AWS Ground Station is a fully managed service that's integrated into our production network. So you access the Ground Station the same way you access any other service. And you can then downlink your data and immediately put it into what we call an S3 bucket for storage. And um, we have the technology now that we can also do the same thing for the government owned and contractor owned antennas in a near space ne or near earth network and enable you to do the same types of operations with your antennas to get that data into the S3 buckets. So then you've got the raw images, you've got a variety of serverless applications that you can then use in the AWS environment, your virtual private cloud as it's called, so that you can pre-process your raw images in a level zero type of format. Now you're gonna have stored raw data, and then you're gonna move down the uh, pre-processed data as well and keep that into S3 buckets. And you're gonna manage all of your um, metadata, knowledge of where everything's stored, what's stored, what it is, attributes that you wanna define in a, a database like Amazon Dynamo. And then you're gonna be able to act, keep it into the lowest cost storage mechanisms possible all over the world. And you could go access that data whenever you need to do science or whenever you need your um, uh, PIs to be able to get to it then they can move that data over into their virtual private cloud, but still even in the same region, they can do uh, processing on it to get it anywhere from level one to three. You can use um, Elastic Kubernetes service, a variety of other container capabilities as well. So you can put a lot of the applications that you've already built into containers and use them to actually do the different types of science missions that you've already got built in the cloud context and store everything again in an S3 bucket so that all of your data from raw, level zero, level one, all the way through level four even, you can keep in different places, different buckets for different science purposes. And it's just an IP address away for all of your community to be able to get to the data. And now you can manage it with um, uh, identity access and management controls, et cetera. So we wanna give NASA in, in your EOS architecture, the ability to share real-time data through the cloud anywhere, process it and store it so you can get to it instantly anytime you want to. And we can do this today. So here's some examples even. Mars 2020, I think you guys are more familiar with Mars 2020 than I am. So the, needless to say, we're, we're very familiar with the JPL and working on the Perseverance's data and some other data as well and able to help store it, process it quickly. Capella Space, started by Payam um, Benazada, who also came from JPL, is an incredible example for you guys to go learn how that satellite system from concept all the way to development, tasking, management, processing of the data and storage of the data, and then moving of L0 through L4 products around the world in milliseconds, it's all done on AWS. So it's a very scalable, demonstrable system that you could do again. And then we've also been eating this dog food from the point of view of the Amazon Sustainability Data Initiative, where we're, we're experimenting with giving grants to different customers so that they can then bring the science to the data and access it so that they don't ever have to build that infrastructure themselves. And it supports massive open science, large scale data analytics. 
So I'm going to hand it over to Ben, who will wow you guys with the real incredible stuff, which is the data science. <laughs> Thanks, Shane. Um, so as we're talking about some of the services and approaches uh, to be able to do that sort of data science, uh, we want to really focus on two additional use cases. Uh, one is the Hilo physics use case. And if you actually look in the chat, you can see a link to this case study now. Uh, but really, this is really interesting because NASA jointly teamed with us to be able to build some, uh, some models to be able to detect solar flares. Uh, and we'll talk about how the speed of science really matters here. Uh, they were able to use higher level services so they could focus on building the models uh, in serverless methodologies and really get that prediction model very, very uh, quick turnaround and elastically scale uh, using services like SageMaker, which we're gonna talk about shortly. In fact, we have a, a nice demo video for you uh, towards the end talking about some of those services. Uh, another really good example that we've seen a lot of laboratories and, and these organizations really take on is how can they leverage AI ML uh, in your research environment, but also do things like vaccination verification. Uh, I work with a, a couple teams where they're able to put together end-to-end -end solutions within about two weeks, uh, being able to take vaccination records, uh, detect what type of records they are, uh, is it from the CDC or from a different vendor, uh, parse all the fields out using machine learning and get that information so the researchers and engineers can come, come back to the laboratory. So, um, just want to talk about that because it's nice to kind of frame uh, a lot of these services in some real use cases that um, really were able to get developed very, very quickly. So if we go to the next slide here um, and we take a look at this, uh, you know, the first thing that you'll see is uh, the different layers of, of technology. Uh, so as Shane was talking about, you know, the data flows growing from ground station to containerization. Um, and I, I like to show this also talking about standards because as you're leveraging those different services and that data flow, it's all about standards. It's standards of data. It's standards of communication. It's standards of uh, you know, uh, security, uh, auditing, uh, machine learning models like Onyx. There's st actually standards uh, almost everywhere you look, even if you're not looking for them. Uh, and that really is what's enabling a lot of these tiers to work. Without standards, you can't bring in models and you can't take them out. And it, it's really kind of critical uh, throughout this entire architecture. So like you have teams at JPL, like Hook's team that are leveraging GPUs and CPUs and spot market. You could also do things like uh, launch FPGAs and quantum. Uh, so down at the lowest level, even when you're working with that infrastructure, uh, it's again, all about standards of, of you know, what quantum computer am I talking to, those sorts of things. Um, I wanted to save some time for, for, uh, for the presentation, uh, but just really, really quickly, um, let me talk a little bit about the middle stack to frame the presentation or the, really the demonstration uh, that you're gonna see here in a moment. Um, so there's a lot of different personas uh, as it relates to projects and, and who's doing machine learning. Uh, what we really want to show is a common methodology of citizen data scientists solving some of the machine learning problems and, and deriving value, and then handing that over to almost like the ninja data scientists. Uh, and this is a common methodology, you know, when you're partnering with academia and a lot of different situations. So watching that video, hopefully you see how it goes doing simple things very, very effectively and then unlocking kind of the keys so that like the, the ninja data scientists go in and do a lot more advanced modeling. So hopefully that comes across and uh, from there, I'll go ahead and uh, switch over back to Shane on the next slide. And so very quickly, guys, we just wanted to show you that just like a, a Ben was able to show you that common uh, framework of all the services and then get even into the standardization. We've also got some great experience where JPL will be able to apply like their open science and community applications, much the way that we built this AWS and um, JPL quick start, where we put same, some of the Amos capabilities out there on GitHub so that customers could actually use JPL applications to analyze the data for managing satellites, TTNC, downlinking data and, and uh, processing it. Every other application you guys work on with the citizen scientists like Ben just brought up is also able to follow the same model so that you could deploy out every capability you wanted these scientists to use. And then the SageMaker models, et cetera, that Ben's gonna talk about to do this type of science. Back to you, Ben. All right, uh, so if we could uh, go ahead and start that video, Shane. Um, hopefully, uh, hopefully you can hear sound as well. If not, I could annotate what, what's happening. We'll see. 
Okay, uh, I, I talked about a little bit of what's happening here. So essentially uh, what we're showing is uh, two data sets that are gonna be brought into the tool. Uh, you know, keep in mind data could be flowing from ground station and from these different uh, data sources. Uh, and really what it looks like to be able to build a, a machine learning model uh, with pretty good accuracy. Uh, this is a, a pretty clean data set for full transparency. Uh, the accuracy of some of these demos, if you're using like the IRIS data set, that is naturally very, very easy to build models on, the accuracy is more. Um, you know, but what we're gonna show here is how you could then go in and build this model. So we're gonna go in and create this new model. Uh, we're gonna give it a, a, a name to represent uh, kind of uh, this model generation process. Uh, and what you'll notice is, you know, it's giving you a lot of data, uh, data exploration. Uh, sure, I could go in and pandas or matplotlib, you know, pick my favorite plotting tool and start plotting these. But as a data scientist or as a researcher, it'd be great if I just see all the data as soon as I upload it into the tool, right? Um, so you could go in here, you could select different fields. For example, this field uh, doesn't have much relation to a target variable. Uh, so you, you could go in and really disable uh, through either WYSIWYG, what you see is what you get, uh, or through code, uh, you know, essentially the, the data processing steps. Uh, and this is really what becomes another, another standard in some ways. <laughs> we're using kind of Apache standards to represent a lot of this, but we're creating a data flow uh, that then could be shared uh, with the data scientists that you're going to see shortly. Uh, really neat features here. You could actually uh, do things like identify feature importance. Uh, you could generate a lot of different kind of bias reports, uh, you know, uh, to be able to identify, you know, your data distributions as it pertains to your target variable and, and a lot of other kind of considerations. Um, we're not going to show them all here, obviously, in the interest of time. Um, but what I get really excited about is, uh, you know, not only enabling, you know, the, those uh, folks that may not be formally trained in data science to be able to start building these models, uh, but also doing something like this. So what we did is we, we were able to take that, that work that was already generated uh, and then uh, bring it into a Jupyter environment. And we could bring it in different environments, uh, you know, PyCharm and other things as well. Uh, but here we're actually looking at some Jupyter notebooks to be able to then uh, really represent the data process that we created through the, the wizard. Uh, so there's full transparency. You can see exactly what the, what the tool is doing to do the, the feature engineering. Um, our, our example isn't that interesting when it comes to feature engineering. We're just dropping a field, but it really captures all that information. And you can see all the different performance metrics under the covers. Um, you know, the, the one other thing worth calling out here, and we could probably go ahead and, uh, you know, on the interest of time, um, you know, skip ahead a little bit. But um, again, here you could actually see the different features and how it relates to the target variable. Uh, you could generate, um, you know, Shapley values. Uh, you could do kind of all those sorts of things under the covers as well. Um, one last point on the top right, you know, you could actually go in and deploy the model. So, you know, in the research space, it's very common to build your model and need to save it in process, you know, uh, perpetuity for different research uh, reasons. Maybe it's a grant and you always need that, that for recreatability. You could also then take these models and deploy them as endpoints. Um, so you can actually deploy the, the model different ways for batch inferencing versus, um, versus real-time inferencing. And that's what the, the button he's point, uh, that's being pointed to right now represents. So. Um, uh, very cool when we can do live demos. Unfortunately, this one uh, had to be recorded. So hopefully that gives you a gist of uh, a little bit of the experience that you could have kind of navigating. And you'll notice, you know, we didn't really show anything that was an AWS admin console with 200 plus services. Uh, you know, we showed very familiar interfaces that your you know, data scientists want to live in. So, all right, thank you. All right, one minute, unless that was it. Uh, Shane, do you... Uh... Oh, that was nope that that was it for us guys so thank you very much i'm actually impressed we made it under the 15 minutes yeah you're <laughs> right on yeah very good thank you both nice presentation all right yeah y'all have a good day we appreciate it thank you all right you thank too you very much. travels take care all right so up next uh we had a uh presenter change so we want to Thank you, Ian, uh, for stepping in. And I believe Karen's gonna share slides for you. Um, Karen, you could bring those up. Yeah, I think that's right. And can you guys hear me okay? Can definitely hear you, yep. All right, wonderful. Yeah, so I apologize. I'm gonna leave my video off. I can tell we're having some um, 
flow issues here on this end. So I'm going to cut the incoming and outgoing video and, and hopefully that'll, that'll keep things running smoothly. I'm going to no show problem my screen. Understood. Thank you. While you're doing that, I'm going to just take a brief moment. Uh, I'd like to introduce Ian Brosnan. Uh, he's been with NASA since 2014 he's at the Ames Research Center, working in a variety of science, technology, and interagency collaboration roles. He's currently the coordinator for the Ames Research Center's Earth System Observatory mission activities and the principal investigator for the NASA Earth Exchange Project. Again, uh, thank you and welcome, Ian. Go ahead, take it away. All right. Well, uh, thank you for that that introduction, um, and thanks too for the opportunity to to offer the Open NEX perspective. Uh, so, as mentioned, I am now the uh, principal investigator for uh, NEX. Uh, Raman Amani, who many of you may have known, retired at the end of last year. So it's, um, it's definitely an honor to, to pick up uh, and try to at least fill a little bit of his shoes. So Elias, it's Friday. Uh, it's day four of this workshop for many of you. Um, and a lot of what I'm going to talk about in sort of historical perspective uh, there's a lot of work that I actually wasn't present for. Uh, so, you know, Andy Michaelis and uh, Jennifer Dungan, I think we've got some other members of the team beyond for the fishbowl. So be able to kind of fill any gaps, uh, and answer any questions you have then. So could we go to the next slide, please? Okay, so just a little bit of um, background here. So NEX um, has evolved over the years, um, probably over the last say, 15, nearly 20 years, uh, we've kind of conceived to enable scientific collaboration um, right, by bringing big data next to compute and really reducing uh, a need then to move large data sets around. Uh, and then also with the intent to facilitate the sharing of redundant code and workflows. And so I like to think of us now as, as working in this intersection between meaningful science, big remote data, um, big remote sensing data and modeling analysis that has to be done um, at large scale, either on an HPC, right, or on-prem system and cloud computing. And so we are, we're a very small team. We're primarily a mix uh, of scientists, um, whether it's earth science, data science, um, computer science, we're kind of wrapped up in that team mix there uh, and then some administrative support at the bottom. And I think that's kind of key as you as you look at the projects I'm going to present here and, and kind of think about the team and structure that's behind them. Next slide, please. So as I mentioned uh, in the early days, right, I think Next really managed to overcome a challenge. I think a lot of us who were working at that time were a member of finding, ordering, waiting forever for your data to come, uh, doing a lot of the pre-processing, and then trying to perform large-scale computing with big data. And the way that was done is in that top right box there, right? It was a sandbox server. Next operated for prototyping and development. Uh, that people could then transition over to an HPC system to do large scale processing once the bugs are worked out and drew on a data store that was co-located that included both NASA data and community contributed data. And it got a key piece there, right? The data store is not a DAC. Um, we bring data, stage it um, as needed, and then as we need more space, we'll either grow the data store or just move uh, data that's no longer actively being used off, uh, and we can bring it back in if needs be. All right, so that, that was great, right? But having done that, it's presented a, a broad array of new challenges, um, right? The security constraints, uh, in particular, the onboarding logistics which require a lot of overhead, right? That was things as simple as, right? nailing physical RSO taken, RSA tokens out to new team members, right? getting folks trained up um, so they can be identified and authenticated into the system. So OpenNEX you know, evolved out of that uh, as an effort to overcome some of these barriers uh, while simultaneously exploring you know, what were then right, some early cloud offerings available to us. So OpenNEX itself isn't a project, it's a banner for a number of what I would call low TRL activities that were sponsored by AIST, by ACCESS, um, by the Research and Analysis Program, and by Applied Science. And so not being a, a project formally, it didn't have that same list of you know, formal requirements. But I would say the things that were driving at that point were growing the access so that it was open to the global earth science community and not a smaller community that we were able to bring in um, onto our kind of sandbox, hack, and data store. Uh, and then start to drive or use some of that community contributed data and workflows. And so we've evolved a little bit to having a front facing website that allowed us to register users, uh, do knowledge management, knowledge capture, 
and also allowed people to kind of search on those, those registrations, those codes, those workflows. Uh, then working both with um, high-end computing capability here at Ames and also in the cloud for our prototyping, large processing, uh, and then using both data store and cloud as appropriate for those data sets that we were, we were really working on larger projects. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so I'll kind of trace you through the, the series of activities. Um, I'll show you very quickly the kind of rough up of the architectures that were used and, and maybe just kind of close with a little bit of perspective. I think of what we, what we learned through time uh, and where we kind of you know, stand today as, as OSSI begins to grow further. So our, I say our first kind of next or open NEX um, bannered activities were really around both the combination of data on the cloud hosted workshops and space apps challenges which sort of kicked off around 2012 ran through kind of sometime in 2014. So the first big move right which and then today seems very obvious but I think then was a very new right was to create a space act agreement that allowed us to host uh, climate downscale data and large remote sensing data sets on Amazon's S3 buckets. And then to sort of build there to the space apps challenges where we provided accessible virtual machines scientific workflows, user guides, uh, expert speakers and expert guides, and a bit of on-demand computing to allow relatively naive users to come onto the platform and you know, build new applications on that data using those workflows and that, what they had learned from those experts within about a 48 hour period. Now, what was kind of demonstrated here um, was not, I think maybe some of the science, but really that we could get speed and efficiency and improvements by not just bringing data compute workflows and knowledge together, but really making it accessible to a broader community than one we can bring in on-prem. Um, and I've kind of, I've got this kind of humorous line at the bottom, right? One of the teams that was award-winning was Drunk Puppy Tea Theater. And I think it's kind of important to remember because I think people sometimes get confused about this. We can't replace science in these 48 hour um, sprints, right? But we can prove and demonstrate gain interest um, from the community, right? The Junk Puppy Tea Theater hasn't published that I'm aware of, right? Any groundbreaking science from their award-winning application. So, all right. So that kind of now in the 2012 to 2014 timeframe, we're at a place now where we've demonstrated that the cloud really has some new offerings, some new capabilities, the ability to speed things up above what we've seen before. Important question for us, right, is how do we take what we have right, and our HPC systems and move seamlessly back and forth between, you know, the cloud environment and that environment, right? So this is an access proposal. Um, it was funded through NASA, uh, really intended to, to enhance um, access uh, by through packaging, moving and deploying these algorithms, these tools and these services, right? What are called containers, as most of you know. Um, and that allowed us to begin to move things back and forth also allowed us to document and provide training to our internal user group, right? I think we'd like to go larger, but we're kind of discussing, right? These are small projects. So working with our team first um, and trying to sort of explore this space of open NEX. And then this sort of put us into this third place, right? We're like, okay, cloud is great. A lot of capability. We can move things back and forth between, try to move to a place where it's a little more seamless. But how do we then get to that um, recommendations and reuse piece? And so this was an AIST project, Advanced Information Systems Technology, done through the Earth System, sorry, Earth Science Technology Office. So very low TRL effort here. What we were looking to do was build on our architecture with a tool that would recommend to new users uh, which components and workflows they might be able to reuse. Ones they might know about. Uh, ones they may have absolutely no idea existed uh, right by leveraging some of this social network analysis. Uh, can we drop next slide, please? So there was a quick question about system architecture. Um, and again, right, so we're pulling some, some pretty dated material here, but this should just kind of give you the, the visual view of how we were working. Um, but working through a web platform, not just our own kind of website, uh, which lets us provide um, user information, but to get in, use these virtual machines, the data that we had up um, on S3, and then tap into whatever AWS bundled services were available at that time. Uh, let's see, can we go to the next slide? Okay, so this one's a little bit more depth, right? This was the access project. Um, and so you can see the blue boxes 
for what existed at the start, right? So we have users running code on NEX there in the top right. We were able to capture some of that code information and in the various dependencies in a NEX provenance database, slide those workflow components back out into the next workflow system, but also then begin to con build containers out of those and move them into the next knowledge management system, which is tapped over to the CMR, uh, metadata repository, common metadata repository that was discoverable. And then this was intended to allow users right, to be able to deploy these containers anywhere, right? On their laptop, within the, the hex system, um, or try to scale them up on the cloud. Next slide. Okay, and then this is the third piece, right? This is Jia Zhang's um, workflow recommendations and use project. And so that builds again, right? So the box in the bottom right is the one you just saw. Apologize, I think the formatting has changed a little bit. That network should be inside that box, uh, not orphan down there on the bottom. But that, that was an engine, an analytical engine that would use social network techniques to understand people, data, module, and workflow networks that existed on NEX that weren't immediately visible. And new users could come and they could plug into that engine via a particular web plugin that was termed Viz Trails. Um, and then as essentially the libraries exploit those networks to speed up, you know their own development of their workflows or to just take them in new directions they didn't realize were possible when that system would illustrate a network connection or a workflow that had add-ons they hadn't really thought about before. So it's a very powerful tool, but again, a very low TRL project that was, that was developed. Okay, can we go next slide? Okay, so this is just where we wanted to maybe share a little bit of thoughts and perspective um, from those three projects, right? So, you know, for us, open science really evolved from bringing big data and computing together with expertise as a science enabler, but for a bit more of a constrained group to making that a little more accessible to the broader science community. And then thinking a little bit about how we start to push towards more efficient tools that allow these users to understand, reproduce and repurpose the application and workflows that already exist. So at this point, right, many of our open NEX projects have concluded, right? There were small grants and we're incorporating kind of lessons learned or pieces of those technologies into our day-to-day -day work. But I think what we would maybe kind of share with you, right, is that these sort of grants for innovation in open science and community collaboration yield results. You know, for the bits of the workshop that they've been able to, to dial into, uh, I think the things we've, we've heard even today, right, a lot of what was was explored through Open NEX and, and other groups, right? This wasn't just us, um, have really grown to be huge enablers of the science community um, and a, a vibrant and active ecosystem. Uh, it's, it's great to see. Uh, and I think that's, as we go forward, right? A remind, a remembering that these, these small low TRL projects to try to push things forward um, are hugely important. That said, right, despite that, right, even here within NEX and on the team, I think people speak to this, right, we still have to overcome resistance to change, right, to novelty. Uh, and, you know, another thing, that, you know, certainly a feature of what we do, right, are the cultural differences internally between how we operate in the science sphere, uh, how people work then again in information technology and particularly in cybersecurity. I know, you know, it's a tendency to say, right, the cybersecurity should be more like science or science should be more like cybersecurity. And that, that's probably not going to happen. But I think just being aware of those differences uh, and thinking about how we can, you know, from a science side, bring the cybersecurity folks along with us in some respect. Um, and in our end, I think it's being cognizant of the fact that they do raise some real challenges. Um, and our, our open approach presents them with um, probably some heart stopping challenges. I think, you know, coming down to the second to last bullet, right? It's still clear to us, right? That there are disincentives to share software and code for reuse um, among scientists. And I, I would distinguish there, there's not a disincentive to collaborate because that's, that's, that's happening, right? But seeding some of the competitive advantage you have when code, scientific code and scientific software you develop for your particular research project. And I think that's gonna continue to be a big hurdle, right? To overcome and I think it's going to be, if, you know, if we're going to succeed, that's a massive change, both in the culture and the incentives in science. But one place that I think there is space for low hanging fruit, and I, um, Dan really kind of highlighted this with his you know, reverse process, 
is a lot of that code and software, when, you, when you've accomplished your primary kind of scientific objective and you've done your, your boutique and impactful analysis and published, right? It's there. There isn't currently an incentive for you to take that, you know, speaking kind of figuratively here, to take that out of your desk drawer and share it, right? But you might be willing to, right, with the right incentives. And that's something I think would a place we can really focus and, and make some advances. And then finally, are ready? yep, are we done? Uh, one minute. One minute, okay, great. Well, this is last slide, last bullet. So I think pretty obviously here, right, the valley of death remains a challenge for us. Um, you know, we're a small team, primarily of, as mentioned, scientists of various flavors, right? And so for us, it's a real challenge to determine kind of which projects continue, how do they continue and where, and how we bring the funding together to take these disparate efforts and move them into something a bit more coherent. So I'll wrap up there. Uh, really appreciate the opportunity to speak and I will yield the last few seconds that I have back to Luke, appreciate it. Very good, thank you, Ian. Uh, and please stick around and, and join us at the Q&A session after our last presenter uh, who's coming up next. All right, so before our, our break, uh, I'm sorry, before the Q&A kicks off, we have one more presentation. Uh, sorry, I reversed the order slightly. Uh, George Chang from the Jet Propulsion Laboratory is the task lead and the platform lead for the Multi-Mission Algorithm and Analysis Project, or MAP. He is also a technical group supervisor for the Interactive Science Data Tools and User Interfaces Group at JPL. Previously, he served as the software development lead on the Physical Oceanogra Oceanography Distributed Active Archive Center, or PODAC, and has extensive experience working with both Earth science and planetary, planetary science data systems. So welcome, George. Uh, go ahead and take it away. All right, thanks, Luke. Um, hopefully you guys can all hear me and see my slides. This looks great, thank you. Check. Okay, awesome. So, you know, before I start, you know, I'd like to say this, you know, MAP is a group effort. So even though I'm the one presenting, there are a lot of people who have helped out, you know, active collaborations um, within MAP. We are a multi NASA center as well as multi agency um, between NASA and ESA project. And so, yeah, a lot of folks came together to put together, you know, this, this platform. Um, for these slides, this is actually a condensed version of, you know, several patients we've given in the past. So, you know, I didn't create all of them, you know, shout outs to Hukwa, uh, Kaylin Bugby from Marshall, um, Amy Barchowskis from Development Seed, and our scientist Laura Duncanson, Marco Lavau, and everyone else, you know, for helping out, um, you know, with the project and these slides. So like I mentioned, you know, MAP is an open science collaboration framework between NASA and ESA. Um, I was sitting yesterday in the ESA presentation and seems like um, Klaus mentioned MAP, you know, as part of his talk as well. So, you know, it has significant presence, at least in the science data processing for both NASA and ESA side. Um, its goal is to, you know, collaboratively share data, uh, science algorithms, and compute resources in order to foster and accelerate scientific research uh, conducted by both NASA and ESA scientists. Um, it's, you know, an interoperable set of shared resources um, integrated into a virtual collaborative platform in the cloud. And I'll describe, you know, how that's done. Um, with special capabilities for seamless and efficient global team science activities. It's, you know, a full cloud-based sharing environment of appropriate large satellite boarding data stores, as well as code and runtime images. Um, interoperability between cloud-based virtualizations, development compute resources, and collaborative work environments, and interoperability with full access to all the above. So, you know, MAP itself has a very ambitious goal. Again, you know, it, it was started to foster this relationship with, you know, NASA and ESA um, to share data that previously had been kind of, you know, hidden, isolated between the agencies and through you know, open source and open science, you know, we've kind of opened up the channels for scientists on both sides of the ocean to collaborate and, you know, use each other's data to produce, produce you know, new results and new findings. So let's see, next slide. Actually. Oh, so, um, let me close this here. So, you know, I like to start off with a success story. So this is uh, during our, I guess map announcement uh, back in last October. So um, we were able to get both NASA and ESA scientists, actually international group of scientists to work together on the map platform to collaborate um, to produce the ISAT2 boreal biomass product. So that's what you see here. Um, let's see, 
sorry, let me turn on the pointer here. So, you know, I have the URLs here. Here were the joint um, announcements, um, joint news briefings from both NASA and ESA web portals. Um, announcing, you know, the launch of the platform and you know, our first, I guess, draft product. Um, and here, what you see is, you know, the processing that we've done. You know, this is kind of a customized view that, you know, our scientists were able to see as the data was processing. So each one of those grids, they're basically a data product. Those are tiles that, you know, were being computed within our system, our data processing system. Um, I believe there were on the order of 4,000, up in the thousands of them. And so it was um, a pretty lengthy process and it was all, again, done in map. Um, scientists were able to visualize it, you know, see the process as it was coming along, you know, the squares become blue as the data products were, were being processed. And so, you know, we were able to, again, alongside the uh, news release, we were able to kind of show, you know, uh, actual product that again was, you know, done collaboratively um, between NASA and ESA. And again, like I said, you know, in the full length presentation, this, the, the workflow for this in itself would take like an hour um, to present, but it was a really incredible story where, you know, the NASA team could, you know, develop algorithms on the NASA side and then allow the ESA team to come and, you know, look at the notebooks and the algorithms and then run it through our data processing service um, to, to have it, you know, run, run at scale. So here um, is our overall architecture. And so again, the theme of the presentation is on the architecture and the components. So I'll you know, focus on that. And just a few things to kind of highlight. We do have the ESA components um, up to the right. So you know, as part of this joint um, system, ESA themselves have a similar system. It's a different implementation. And so you know, there are some differences, for example, you know, on the NASA side, we you know, leverage Amazon Web Services. Amazon is an American company, so obviously, you know, it, it's it's what we would choose. But on the ESA side, they actually don't use Amazon. Again, Amazon, U.S. company, they actually use a European service called Orange, Orange Cloud, and so they have similar you know capabilities as Amazon. They have an object store, they have compute, and in addition, a lot of our tools that we have here, you know, we base it on existing again NASA or you know U.S. based open source products. Um, on the ESA side, they use a lot of their own um, open source tools as well. And so ultimately, you know, we are one system um, that talk through common APIs. Um, we have a common set of requirements, but the implementation is different. And you know, that's actually presented you know, several opportunities as well as challenges um, in you know, our system here. And so just kind of a quick highlight over what we have. You know, the two highlights I would say is you know, our algorithm development environment, which is an online um, collaborative environment, you know, it's based actually off Eclipse Tray, which allows us to use Jupyter Notebooks, which again are very popular, but it also allows us to, you know, integrate uh, other in development environments um, that allow for C, C++, um, PHP, if you're interested in that, we all can also include our studio, uh, as well as, you know, uh, numerous other web-based UIs. And the other uh, key aspect is the data management system here. And so this is where we manage, you know, a map data store, which is our own data catalog, which is based off CMR, as well as, you know, providing access to external resources where we have uh, metadata catalogs. And so if I go here, um, for example, like I said, you know, the data management services reuses a lot of the software that's being used by NASA as this in the DAX, you know, cataloging, CMR, um, use Cumulus and Jesta, um, and you know we can we, we derive the software. We have some customizations, but in effect, we are um, compatible with you know the CMR requests both here and as well as uh, I guess CMR proper. And then the other big one is also our data processing service. So this has a heritage through the Highest DS uh, open source pro project, which um, has software used by you know our flight missions. It runs on Amazon, uses spot instances, and allows us to, you know, do large-scale computing at, you know, fairly low cost. And finally, you know, another component is the story aspect, right? So with the data, the processing, we also use the COVID-19 dashboard, which we've remapped, uh, reused into the map dashboard. And that allows us to produce, you know, interactive story and storytelling um, based on the data that we have. 
And so, you know, I'm just going to go quickly through our you know, main components. Uh, authentication authorization, I think, is a great feature of MAP, one of the more unique features that we have. So, you know, because we are multi agency, this provides us, gives us the capability to provide um, lightly vetted authentication for our users. Um, you can log in either through, you know, uh, Earth Data Login or the ESA's uh, own, you know, OAuth 2 login. Um, when you log in through Earth Data, one of the innovative features we've created is the ability to seamlessly access data from the DAX. We truly believe that, you know, one of the advantages of using MAP is this, you know, access to the entire NASA data catalog. So in that sense, um, when you log in, you know, we leverage the Earth Data Logins Federated Tokens, which gives you basic single sign-on to any of the data. You don't have to log in again to the DAC to access data. Um, and recently we created the ability to you know, generate AWS specific keys for direct S3 access um, into the DAX. And so, you know, to do things like um, range gets, you know, on, on the fly subsetting of data, you know, in objects, you can do that with um, our tool now. Algorithm development environment. Um, like I said, it's based off of, you know, Eclipse Tray, which is basically a workspace manager. Each workspace is, you know, container-based Kubernetes. We primarily do Jupyter Lab right now, but we have shown that we can do RStudio and, you know, various other tools. And within Jupyter, we've also included, you know, custom plugins and additions, uh, integrated Earth Data Search to browse data and bring it directly into the notebook, custom APIs, and also, you know, integration with our data processing uh, service for large data. Um, again, data processing. Our data system, you know, really incredible work here with integrating data, preparing data in, um, I guess, precursors to analysis ready data. We have COGS, we have EPTs for, you know, visualization and point clouds, which you see here. And yeah, we, per we do curate, you know, a small set of data. And then we also access, allow access to the NASA DAX as a whole. Our map dashboard, again, this reuses a lot of the work that you know, was started with the COVID-19 dashboard. And what we bring here is you know, the data that we produce, we consolidate it into this user interface where scientists can add stories to it. So as you're presenting you know, your work, um, it's an interactive you know, uh, user interface where you can kind of talk about what you know, your science means to the community. Again, like most things with, with all things in MAP, it's using uh, open source pro products and uh, projects and frameworks. And finally, our data processing service, like I said, is the workhorse of our platform um, built off high SDS. Uh, I'll go quickly through these graphs here, but what's showing is, you know, we've been able to configure it to scale up to 2000 concurrent nodes um, in the system. And so, you know, when the scientists were processing their data, you know, it's spun up on the fly, on demand, um, to 2,000 concurrent nodes to process. And then when it's done, you know, the nodes reduced down. We've been, you know, able to increase that to 4,000, which is approaching uh, market maker status in spot instances. Um, and also, you know, that's in the range of what flight missions actually use for processing. So, you know, scientists are given a lot of power um, for their processes. And then finally, you know, my last slide here, just additional implementation details about architecture. We do deploy this within the Goddard Mission Cloud platform, which is an MCE, uh, Managed Cloud Environment for Amazon Web Services. Like I said, ESA uses Orange Cloud. Map system is developed in the open. Um, it uses uh, public GitHub for uh, all of our you know, framework code. We also have an internal GitLab instance um, in our architecture that is for use for scientists with you know, their algorithms. Um, and then MAP has an extensive programmatic API. So in, in addition to all the UIs that you've seen, uh, most things, you know, running, running jobs, you know, registration, registering algorithms, um, you know, committing code and interacting with uh, the ADE algorithm development environment can be done with the API. And finally, the big, the big elephant in the room is uh, costs, right? So right now um, we're limited to a small set of approved users, small meaning you know, 30 to 60 users. Um, we, we measure the cost. We have metrics to you know, count you know, who uses what for how long. But in terms of billing, you know, we are still working on that. There's, you know, we don't have a whaling users right now. So all the work that's being done is being um, paid by the project, but we are looking at you know, how we can 
you know, get more users and have, you know, a, a sensible, you know, billing scheme. Um, and I think that's it. Yeah, but I just barely made it. Yes, nicely done. Thank you, George. All right, got thank a you. Little time back. Uh, so we are slightly behind, uh, but we are going to still have a Q&A session followed by a break. So I'd like to invite Elias to come on. And if we could bring back all of the presenters, if you're still on, please turn on your video for this. Uh, for those of you that were presenting or supporting the presentations, that'd be great. All right, I'll turn it over to you, Elias. Thank you, Luke. Um, you know, we've got 10 minutes here before our break and we're getting sort of in the middle of the day and towards the end. So let's try to make these uh, quick, but we do have some questions. Uh, first question here is for Ian. Um, in the open uh, NEX system that you showed, uh, do you envision it being able to support uh, mission data processing and doing keep up processing, uh, data product generation and latency, uh, where latency is a driver? Have you seen that use case uh, for your system or have you actually seen it used in that way? Is Ian with us? I don't see him on the call at the moment. Yeah, I believe he dropped off. Uh, Jennifer? Right. No worries. And it looked like some of the AWS folks as well had dropped off. Uh, no worries. We'll come up to uh, a question. They may, they may be dialed in over the phone. You can speak up. Uh, if you're here, let us know. Otherwise, we'll move to. Uh, another set of questions, as I said, we do have quite a few here. Um, one of the discussions that obviously spent, we spent a lot of time on yesterday was the breakout sessions. Uh, and there was a, a deep dive into AWS costs versus sort of on-prem. Uh, and at least in some oh. use cases, or in many use cases, there was sort of a, a division. You know, sometimes it makes sense to do things on-prem. Sometimes it makes sense to do them in the cloud. Uh, and we saw that with many of the MDPS implementations uh, where they were built mostly on-prem, but they actually had the capacity to do processing and other things there. Um, so maybe I can ask this of George, in terms of defining MAP, how did you consider using HEC uh, as a processing backend? And if not, why not? So as Bob mentioned in the chat, we are actually thinking of, we actually started a subtask to do you know, HEC. Uh, high-end computing um, as a backend, right? So this, you know, definitely brings up different challenges. Um, but you know, ultimately, I think the goal of Map is to make all of this invisible to the user, right? You know, if the users, scientists, want to do processing, you know, they just say, you know, I want to process it, you know, with these certain parameters. You know, do they need it now or can they wait? Um, and you know, we the platform would decide, you know, which venue would be the most cost effective, whether it is on Amazon or maybe you know outsource it to HEC. You know, in, in some ways we see the strategic direction, right? The big strategic direction, uh, at least when we look at how this applies to the ESO mission. We're and keeping in mind that that's the scope of this study. Uh, that's the, the four major missions, uh, Earth missions. The characteristics of the mission is that they have lots of data, lots of processing. Uh, you know, in terms of reprocessing, it gets into the thousands of nodes. Uh, looking in that way, and we also see this strategy where from NASA that things are headed, which is sort of a data lake and bringing the processing to the data lake, right? So obviously, having infrastructures uh, that are not within close to the data uh, has presents other challenges. Uh, such as egress and now costs are, are bigger or larger and, and the things you can do. So do you, do you see, and I can address this both to Dan and George, do you guys feel that this is the right strategy we're heading towards sort of a data lake and pricing comes to it, or there's all these disparate processing systems such as you know, on-prem this and infrastructure here and many clouds, and then the data sort of now have to move. Uh, I don't know, what are you guys thoughts on that? Because obviously that's gonna be a big thing that we need to think about. Uh, Dan, would you like to take that? Yeah, sure. So two pronged, right? Like if you're going to to look at it from a multi-cloud perspective, being like, I want burst capability and I want to take like a container stack that's inherently lightweight, uh, but it needs to be attached to, you know, very high terascale scale or low, uh, low petascale data. Uh, public cloud may not be the best option and i'm not really entirely sure because you know egress charges and ingest charges you know, it, it, you know reproducing existing information out of the dax 
it almost seems like you know the right the right thing would be to have some sort of common plane that allows people to bring the application that they are wanting to use as close to the data set as possible. So having some sort of like above the API layer that, you know, so something like a Kubernetes install, you know, um, installation that allows the developer to grab the certified container images or certain stack of technologies they want to use and then you know, physically locate it as close as they can to the DAC, right? So like ASDC at Langley or you know, ASF up in, uh, in Alaska, like, okay, here's the stack that I need. Here's the information, it's you know, geographic location, and I'm just going to locate them as close as possible together. That would be what I would do, but yeah. I see Ben's here. Hey, Ben. Hey, how are you doing? Yeah. Um, yeah. Oh, did you want me to? Uh, I was, I was, okay. let, let me address George with that and get his thoughts on that. Is this Ben from, uh, from AWS? Okay, thanks for joining us. Uh, George, your thoughts on it. What yeah. I heard from Dan no, is no. In, his, in, in his view, moving the, the processing to the data seemed to be the right way to go. Right, I mean, it, it really depends on what the priorities of the mission are, you know, what the costs are, you know, with MAP, because we do work with ESA, you know, one of the consideration is, you know, we haven't gotten to, you know, large, large processing with ESA, but again, they are on Orange Cloud, we are on Amazon. So even though we are one project, we still have egress costs, egress costs, you know, from one to over. Um, you know, one innovation we're trying to do is again, um, common runtime environments. So again, containerizing or putting in a virtual machine and being able to ship this to their processing system and then run it, you know, without modification and they can hook into their data you know, moving the processing closer to the data. Or again, in our case, you know, maybe keeping it on Amazon or moving that same runtime without modification into an HEC environment. And so, you know, it, it really depends on, again, wh what you consider big and, you know, what, what you want to trade off for convenience. Yeah, a good point. I will not ask Ben that, that similar question because I think I know the, the AWS uh, strategy for that, right, which is the data lake and bringing data to it. Uh, but there was a more, um, a, a deeper level question for you, Ben, here. And this had to do with uh, SageMaker. Uh, is, is there a cases or a strategy for SageMaker to also be able to support maybe a forward processing, you know, a stream that's always coming in and needs to process, or is it sort of more run and then come back and do it? Uh, is there a case for that within SageMaker? Um, there, there's started to be, uh, specifically around Spark streaming. So there's different ways of doing streaming, stream processing. There's Spark and Flink and different technologies. So uh, we're starting to add more of the streaming, uh, especially on the inference side. Uh, you know, there are streaming algorithms that you develop as well, where you want to incrementally uh, build a new model. A lot of times in unsupervised machine learning uh, on the stream. Uh, so so the, the short answer is there's, there's some limited support today, but it's definitely growing. And by the way, I, I was going to mention it does make sense to have decentralized data sometimes, but I don't need to go into that. <laughs> uh, yes, thank you for that. I know this one was a shorter session with only 10 minutes, so I'm going to move to sort of some other questions regarding cybersecurity uh, and open science. Um, this question, again, was sort of addressed to, to Ian, but I think it can go to uh, other folks as well. Uh, in terms of overcoming that resistance to change and, and sort of cultural differences between science, information, and cybersecurity. Um, how can the cybersecurity infrastructure help with uh, the decentivizing or the incentivizing of code sharing? Because uh, there's obviously that pull between being able to do more, uh, but then having to deal with the cybersecurity limitations. Um, have you seen that, George or, or Dan, if you guys would like to chime in on that one? I mean, cybersecurity definitely is something that we we tackle with all the time. Um, in terms of incentives, and, you know, incentives for you know cybersecurity is again try to make it as smooth as possible. Like I mentioned, you know, for us, one of the advantage advantages I see with the Map platform is you know you do have to sign in, and you know that is protected, and we do vet every user who you know tries to log in, applies for account. But once you're in, you know, we provide you all these conveniences, right? You know quick access to data, you know, searching data, downloading data, incorporating into your algorithm. You know, once you sign in the first time, all that is handled for you. Again, you know, through the various features of our NASA DACs, which we interact with. Um, and so that, that's a big incentive for people to, you know, to, to actually want to log in and you know, apply for an account. Yep. 
uh, within that platform uh, that you mentioned, and obviously you and I talk a lot, George, we, we know the system mm -hmm. deeper, but is there a mechanism for tracking costs per user uh, within a multi-mission system? And, and do you have some strategies for that? So, so you know, there, there are various ways to track costs. You know, right now we are doing it at the application level. If we wanted to, we could, you know, bump it up to Amazon level with, you know, various tags. What we do um, at the application level is whenever someone submits a job, you know, that job gets tagged with the user and our DPS, high SDS system, you know, keeps track of every job that's run, how long it's been run. I believe networking is also captured. Um, and then workspaces, you know, when people launch workspaces, we know, you know, what workspaces they've run, we know how much memory they've used and, you know, we keep track of all this. And so we can, you know, after the fact, uh, generate, you know, a usage log and convert that into a cost model. I see. So essentially watching and tagging the system, being able mm -hmm. to see what users are doing through the metrics uh, to do that. Um, and, you know, we'd, we'd obviously would follow up a little bit more on you if that's sort of an infrastructure to explore further how to do those things. Uh, a question for you, Dan, in your slides, you had put uh, rely on ISVs for infrastructure. Can you expound a little bit on that? Sure. So talking about the context of open source, um, you know, a lot of the, so for example, right, like NASA, you know, end user services office uh, has, you know, Red Hat Enterprise Linux as a system of record for the end user, right? And that in so many ways is, you know, a, a mechanism to like kind of assuage themselves or dismiss themselves of a, a NASA of a ton of risk, right? You know, we're common criteria certified, FIPS compliant, you know, can meet uh, 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 shipping with a STIG uh, and, you know, all the other 800.53 NIST controls that are associated uh, with running any type of enterprise operating system inside of the government enterprise. So it, in trying to build an open source community around self-developed infrastructure uh, software that's unique for a specific mission, and, you know, uh, for example, I'm actually wearing the, the Perseverance you know, logo shirt today, like the Linux operating system that was developed for the helicopter, right, is super, super duper skinny, but it's never really left the, the compound except for, you know, the actual upstream bits that exist. So in terms of like version controlling infrastructure software, um, I think Livermore has actually done a really good job of this. You can go to opensource.llnl.gov and a lot of their tools around HPC tools and data science are you know, generally available open source, but they are core to the infrastructure that they work on. So they have a, a really substantial control and governance even up over their upstream you know, open source communities. So whatever they bring into the house is you know, pre-certified and you know, somewhat you know, uh, security aware before it ever even hits the shop floor, right? So my comment about like you know, rely on ISVs, uh, so you don't have to maintain you know, stuff that's kind of common operating procedure for your know, day-to-day scientific data production or you know, actually investigating um, science with, with compute. Um, so you don't have to worry about like, okay, like I gotta go pull the most recent version of the GCC compiler, is that gonna borf my application yeah. stack? And it does a lot, right? Like if you rely on somebody else to make those configurations uh, and you know integrations amongst all those tools at the infrastructure layer, the apps just just go build apps and do the work, right? Don't worry about the stuff below the yeah. API. I think I understand what you're saying. Yeah, and I think one of the challenges here is that there's there's multiple infrastructures uh, to worry about and to think of using, and being able to give the management of that low level infrastructure makes sense. Uh, so that's good advice for. Uh, for the team. Elias, I, just I know that we had a hand up one from minute the audience. only, please. Uh, yeah, last last item, please. We did have a hand up from the audience. Uh, should should we allow that question? Yeah, Sengar, do you want to unmute and and ask? Uh, can you hear me? Yep. Yeah. yeah um. Just uh, real quick uh, uh, about data processing on supercomputings. Um. It has been my position that uh, supercomputing shouldn't do the uh, kind of a near real time or uh, kind of a uh, you know uh, data processing when data uh, when data is falling from from sky you know uh, from space, um, but it it's also my position I believe in reprocessing. So uh, some of those uh, use cases like uh, OCO, 
uh, OCO2, um, uh, that kind of a reprocessing ca campaigns. Uh, once you accumulate you know, like two years of data, you wanted to reprocess the data. Uh, uh, you know, that kind of a uh, use cases, um, I think it's uh, uh, very appropriate for um, storing a lot of uh, nodes, uh, cores, you know, to, to process the, the uh, time series very quickly. So it's just a quick comment. Great, thank you for that. Thank you. All right, I think we better wrap up and uh, just wanna again, take a moment, thank all of the presenters, uh, great, great presentations. And we're gonna take a 10 minute break. So everyone can be back at 12.36 uh, Pacific or 3.36 Eastern. Um, we'll see you then. So 10 minutes, thanks everyone. All right. Well, we are nearing the end of this uh, Friday afternoon session. Uh, we've got a few speakers yet to go. Um, so without further ado, why don't we restart and, and um, wrap this up. So next up, we have a presentation on the Unity Science Data System as a Service um, offering. And we have Laura Jewell and Hook Hua who will be presenting, uh, co-presenting that today. Laura is the project manager for the Unity Initiative and is also working on the NISAR SDS as a system engineer, leading the development of the SDS on-demand capability for science team and algorithm development team users. <clears throat> Hook is the chief architect for the Unity project, and he's also been involved with pioneering other efforts in evolving science data processing systems across multi-cloud and uh, HECC environments, as well as integrating them with analysis platforms. He also plays roles in the flight projects as architect for science data systems such as SWAT, NISAR, and the SBG pre-phase A activities. So uh, Laura and Hook, take it away. Slides look good. All right. Thank you. Can you hear me? Can hear you. Um, so just on the on the first slide. So obviously uh, Hook and I are the, the only two names on here, but there's a there's a great team behind us that. Uh, consists of developers and subject matter experts that are truly making this project happen. So I just wanted to acknowledge that. Um, next slide, please. Um, I think we're skipping one. Um, sorry, could you go to the next one? Yeah, thank you. Um, just to summarize a little bit what, uh, what Unity is about, it's uh, envisioned to be a next generation uh, science data system that's service-based. Um, and really focused on mission science data processing. And we're looking to apply this service model approach, this SDS as a service, uh, to support uh, multi-tenancy across multiple customer projects. And we hope that this approach simplifies the, um, the adaptation that customer projects have to do um, to onboard onto uh, an SDS. Um, and we do this uh, with open source science in mind in all aspects where, wherever possible. Um, so we, and as you'll hear a little bit more about today, uh, we include approaches for standards-based uh, interoperable services and algorithms uh, to really help out with collaboration and portability. Um, and for customer projects, this would hopefully mean that this would uh, end up re reducing the cost of SDS uh, development and deployment through reuse. And also I think very importantly, especially for sort of long running flight projects, um, access to technology infusion during the lifetime of a project, uh, especially in the algorithm development and data analysis areas. Uh, one of the key pain points that we're trying to address here is, is the very early on uh, technology lock-in that, that flight projects tend to, tend to sort of suffer from. Um, and um, so as I've, I've mentioned to the flight project a few times, uh, the focus for Unity currently is really uh, the before the archive um, stage. And in FY22, we're building a prototype. So we're still in very early days of, um, of development of Unity. And this is in collaboration with the Sounder SIPs teams at uh, Justisk and JPL. And we're very excited to, to have them on board. Um, let's go back to the requirements. Yeah, thanks. So just to summarize the, the key and driving requirements for, uh, for Unity, um, as I already mentioned, it's, a, it's meant to be an SDS. So it's, a, it's going to provide a platform to store, process, and manage science data products. Um, but we also like to make Unity um, provide a platform for the entire life cycle. So developing, testing, 
and validating the algorithms that end up generating the beta products in an ops-like environment. Um, so really the end-to-end -end process of anything that needs to happen in a science beta system. And we already mentioned the multi-tenancy and managed services and, and open science. Those are three major tenets to um, determining our architecture. And I think that is a good segue into uh, hook section now who will talk more about the architecture and so forth. Great, thank you, Laura. Can you guys hear me? Yep. All right, so um, exactly to Laura's point, um, one of the key things that we're trying to do in this unity uh, approach is really to kind of uh, emphasize um, what are some key things we can do to increase efficiencies for the overall mission science data processing uh, you know, scope and context here. And I think a lot of this starts in, in terms of identifying, recognizing what are some, uh, what is some common vocabulary that we can use in terms of like, what are the key foundational services? I think this is a theme that uh, even uh, just the other day, Jeff Walters had mentioned about, uh, you know, we need to identify the common capabilities, the functional capabilities of emission data processing. And I think that's similar to uh, really points that Doug Newman had made uh, just the other day as well, is that, you know, we talked about the whole lift and shift and moving into the cloud, but really what we're trying to do is, you know, can we even elevate that even uh, one step higher where, you know, not only is it moving into the cloud, uh, but not only is it developing the cloud, but what about the entire cultural shift of, you know, can we, uh, transform into, uh, you know, like this concept of everything as a service where, you know, it's the focus of, of managing the capabilities, having dedicated service teams that own key areas of these foundational service and let them uh, develop it, maintain it, manage it, and really more importantly is to own it in order to mature it and evolve it over time. And I think part of that then is that it allows these service teams to kind of transform how we think about services, really to the point where can we make these services uh, more multi-tenant, uh, where potentially when new tenants are, are you know, signed up, that you know, some of these components could be deployed per tenant or some of these are shared. Uh, the real uh, crux of this is that by you know, attempting to follow this multi-tenant and shared service model and you know, pioneering, uh, or at least, pioneering what, uh, following what Amazon had done in terms of, you know, having service teams kind of own and mature these services, you know, could we use this methodology then uh, to reduce the time to market, right, to, to increase the efficiencies because of this shared capability, you know, if there are bugs and, and are found, you know, could teams develop and fix these bugs in order to then, you know, uh, apply it across all of the users, right, it's, it's some of these foundational common themes uh, that I think Amazon had pioneered. Um, the key idea here is that you know, can we reduce the time for the from algorithm development to where the algorithms can be uh, deployed, matured, validated, and really be run in production? You know, how can we decrease all of that lead time that currently stands today? And I think a lot of that boils down to these key fundamental uh, services from you know the development of the algorithms uh, to cataloging them to taking the same algorithms and deploying them into these processing services. Uh, and then cataloging the results as well as taking the results of those things uh, for, you know, like CalVal analysis, product validation, algorithm validation. Uh, and ultimately also is that this is the context of emission data processing. So, you know, it would ultimately also include delivering the data products to the, the archives. Um, one of the key things as we uh, take one step further uh, uh, in terms of diving into this approach is we're trying to align a lot with uh, the international standards uh, that OHC has defined. Uh, and just taking one step further in into each of these core services, we're, we're looking at uh, aspects where could we take algorithms, uh, whether they're in these notebooks or you know, Jupyter notebooks, uh, for example, and build them through uh, specifications uh, as defined by some of these OGC standards, like OGC has me uh, mechanisms defined for building what's called an application package. And that becomes the basis of interoperability that we can then use to deploy into uh, the notions of uh, multiple distributed uh, you know, execution services effectively, or what they call processing clusters. The idea here is that um, we wanna be able to abstract away and elevate higher level abstraction so that we could have you know implementations that could be on different uh, in, you know different platforms be, uh, behind the scenes. Um, we have actually have uh, related AIST funding that have prototyped many of these things where uh, we have uh, distributed processing clusters, a lowercase cluster, but they're effectively 
uh, processing implementations that are abiding by these uh, OGC standards, such as WPST uh, transactional or these concept of ADS clusters. And the idea there is that we want to be able to make them deployed so that we can run them across, say, you know, Amazon or Google Cloud or Azure Cloud and even NASA supercomputing. Uh, for this Unity uh, prototype, we're focusing mainly on Amazon here, but that's kind of like the idea is, you know, be able to deploy across and be interoperable across these, uh, these services. And where each of these blue boxes here are actually managed and maintained uh, by service teams. The results of these uh, distributed processing would then be uh, delivered and ingested and cataloged, you know, to uh, another service team that's focusing on, uh, you know, data discovery and access. These are the standard set of, you know, like for example, Estes provided uh, capabilities, right? This is not really about reinventing the wheel, but really more about can we take these existing capabilities and, uh, you know, elevate them to where we could manage them uh, for tenants that would be able to log in and utilize uh, Unity as as a managed capability. Um, the idea there is that similarly, you know, we've identified uh, some of these OGC standards as a way to enable the interoperability. Uh, and then finally, with respect to a lot of the mission science data processing scope for doing, you know, analysis for, you know, product validation or CalVal or some of those activities, um, there would be some of these analysis capabilities needed. And similarly as well, OGC has defined uh, well-established uh, standards that really help in these things, things like API features, or even like WC, uh, CPS and DAPA. Um, the idea is that to integrate it all together where the, the notebook environment becomes uh, kind of like the interface both for developers and maybe even you know, operations uh, facilities. A lot of these capabilities that we're describing here actually has similarities with, I think what Issa, Klaus and Nanka uh, presented the other day with respect to the, uh, the EO, Earth Observation and Exploitation uh, Common Architecture. Um, but the idea here is that every single one of these uh, core services here that we're identifying would be managed by these service teams uh, with, the, with the hope that we would increase efficiencies uh, in each of these areas. Um, and finally, least, uh, not, last but not least, there's also this notion where we've identified uh, common capabilities, common services, things like what, uh, what George just talked about, right? The authentication authorization and you know metrics logging billing accounting provenance right deployment automation things like that it doesn't really make sense that each of these service areas reinvents the wheel right there there's a there could be a dedicated service team that would provide, be providing a lot of these uh, common uh, services um, in terms of all of these things uh, together in terms of implementation deployment and operations um, we we're actually adapting a lot of the mature software as a starting point um, uh, things like the aspects of what map uh, what George just talked about with MAP, uh, we had aspects of AIST. Uh, there's many other aspects, but the point though is that we're trying to elevate those things into adding in multi-tenant capabilities. Uh, the data management service team, for example, is looking at some of the existing SDIS capabilities like, uh, for example, CMR or Cumulus and see how can we also use them in a multi-tenant sense. Uh, with respect to open source, it's all it's all open source uh, from the get-go with respect to it being a level one uh, requirement. Uh, and with respect to the standards, I, I mentioned, you know, OGC, right? Um, it, more than just interoperability, I think the key thing about aligning and being compliant with some of these OGC standards is that not only that is that we don't have to reinvent the wheel, but more importantly, uh, with respect to open science, uh, the hope is that with, with this type of compliance, we would have artifacts coming out of Unity where algorithms developing Unity could be portable to also be run in say some of ESA's exploitation platforms or say other platforms or systems that are also compliant with these OGC standards. And then similarly, could other, could algorithms develop in other systems that are OGC compliant, they could also be run uh, similarly uh, inside this Unity uh, you know, approach as well. Uh, with respect to collaboration, I think this is kind of like part of the whole open science thing from the, from the start. Uh, our intent is to enable all, all of these aspects to be collaborative from the get-go, you know, the whole sharing aspects. A lot of the, the themes that George showed for the map uh, is, is, is quite similar here. Um, in terms of cybersecurity, this is, this is uh, one of those key issues, right? Uh, we are designing with cybersecurity implications from the start. I know there's a lot of discussions about, you know, going from DevOps to DevSecOps. Uh, that's kind of like some of these similar notions here where we are working in the Goddard MCP, you know, the Mission Cloud Platform Environment, which is a managed cloud environment. 
Um, there are a lot of those cybersecurity constructs, um, you know, that we that will be addressed from the start using this this type of approach. Um, in terms of the computing environment, I think we're we are uh, for this fiscal year we are starting out in in Amazon, uh, but we are you know leveraging a lot of these other prior NASA investments that have already expanded out you know like such as going bursting back out into say high end computing or other cloud vendors, but for this Unity project scope here we are focusing squarely on Amazon. Um, one of the key things that we're trying to do, obviously, with this managed service and multi-tenancy aspect is to address the efficiencies. And one of the things we really want to highlight is that it's not really just the efficiencies of development or operations, but there's this other concept about staffing as well, right? Is that with instead of having you know 10 different teams all developing the same thing, uh, you know, can we co you know coalesce them and coordinate them into you know managed service teams where we could have helped to improve. And address some of the uh, you know the the re, you know the uh, duplication of efforts, for example. And so there's a lot of ways that we want trying to address some of these uh, you know efficiencies here. Um, finally, there in terms of deployment and operations, um, are the basis of this approach is this prototype here is that we're trying to assess you know how can we make this more efficient by moving over into a a managed and multi-tenant approach. And to do so, we would need to you know deploy. Uh, some of these capabilities uh, automatically. So, you know, multi-tenant deployment is kind of a key aspect uh, in, in this design and, and, and approach. Um, in terms of open science and community collaboration, um, a lot of the algorithms and the assets here are definitely going to be uh, are developed in the open from the start. And I think we, we mentioned about the portability aspect is key, you know, and aligning with uh, some of these international standards uh, really would help uh, in this portability. And the key to reproducibility, obviously, is first we need to be able to make it uh, be portable enough to be rerun by others uh, in other systems or platforms or frameworks. Uh, definitely, in terms of the barriers, uh, you know, we we're just starting out this year. So, but one thing that we have started uh, to face already is the cybersecurity cyber security constraints, uh, things that are needed in terms of opening up the platform, opening up the services, right? Opening up access to, to not just the collaborators in the team, but collaborators, you know, outside of the teams. You know, how do we do this more effectively in, in the context of open science? Um, in terms of enabling community uh, engagement, I think this is something that uh, we're starting this year as well. Uh, we have uh, teams inside UNI that are focusing exactly on this topic as well. And it's we're starting up with community community developer engagement. Um, the system, since it's just, uh, you know, this is just a prototype system, uh, but if we're not yet in a deployment phase, so we're fairly limited right now in terms of the user community engagement at this time. Uh, finally, some right, other- uh, One minute. Great, okay. Uh, last slide here. Uh, notable things here in terms of some of the trade studies we've done, um, aside from things like ANA and, you know, looking at like, you know, manage capabilities for that, um, there we're definitely looking at things like, you know, the whole paradigm shift of going from single tenant based deployments to multi tenant based deployments and elevating those into you know service teams approaches to managing these type of uh, multi tenant based approaches. Um, in terms of uh, systems interfaces, uh, definitely analytic services is key. It's one of the core tenants that's actually still inside the scope for CalVal and product validation and you know science uh, algorithm development. Uh, but our architecture does kind of decouple a lot of, a lot of those things. Um, in terms of the collaboration there, um, I think we've mentioned a lot about the evolving needs of open science. And so having an open and collaborative approach to all of this, it's not just on the development team, but on the user uh, community and user services side of things is really key to this as well. And finally, for the cybersecurity constraints, I, I think this is one of those things uh, that we really want to convey is that we, you know, to try to align with open source science paradigms. Uh, we are rubbing up against a lot of these cybersecurity constraints. I think you know we're trying to get the word out that you know what are some things that could be done uh, to really help facilitate and balance the cybersecurity needs with the open science uh, you know initiatives. And I'll, I'll end with that. Excellent. Thank you both. Nice presentation. Please stick around and and uh, hang in for the Q and A afterwards. All right, I'd like to move us on just to try and gain back a little bit of time. We'll go over to the Science Data Analytics Platform, or SDAP. We have Na Chung will be presenting today, and Thomas Wong will join later 
uh, for any questions. So now as a software, uh, pardon me, now as a software architect and product delivery lead for ingest and archive activities for PODAC. Uh, she's involved in various NASA funded proposals for, for building science data analytic systems. Uh, thank you for joining us today. Take it away, Na. Thanks, Luke. Thanks, everyone. Can you hear me? Great. Sounds so, great. Um, and Thomas is here, so I, it's, it's an honor to represent Apache Estaf. I'm not the only one who works on this. There are many team members involved over the years. Um, so it, it's great to get this invitation and, and chance to um, highlight you know, the work that we've built on um, over the past decade. So here you can see the, the evolution of, of Estaf. You know, we didn't start out as an Apache project. Um, you know, way back in 2011, you know, we, we started out as just exploring the cloud, um, you know, point cloud architecture or um, NASA Nebula, for instance. And, you know, based on, you know, funded efforts through AST, through Access, which I, I hear a lot about today, um, you know, we built on the, 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 the initial framework and, um, you know, there are other JPL projects that have successfully um, um, been an Apache project like ODT. So we've adopted Apache and you know, as of today, we are um, an Apache incubator project. So we're, we're you know, building a framework to enable science. Um, you, know, you see a lot of very nice pictures of tools here that, you know, we're not, um, you know, building all of these tools, but you know, building the framework to enable uh, other users, other projects to, you know, deploy SDAP and leverage some of the capabilities, at the analysis, um, data analysis that we provide. So you can see it ranges from you know a, a user interface to a Jupyter notebook, um, and, and that's really the uh, the goal of, of SDAP. Um, let me close this one. Uh, so again. Uh, we're building an analytics collaborative, collaborative framework to enable uh, you know, st study areas from anything like um, physical oceanography to sea level um, to air quality um, and um, flooding detection or monitoring and detection. And the key idea behind SDAP is really to provide the ability to harmonize all of the, the data that comes in that to, that's needed for these studies. Um, and they're very heterogeneous. You know, data could be from uh, NetCF HDF files, or it could be model model input to things like in situ measurements. And um, the idea is that we don't necessarily want the end users or the tools to have to um, manage or or deal with you know the various formats of these data, but provide an, an API level access to all of the the various data for end users to perform their, their studies. And here, you know, you can see the customers or the target um, potential adopters could be you know, scientists doing um, research to data archive centers, so like the DAX, um, to decision makers, policy makers who leverage, um, you know, SDAP deployments that are in the open to do their, uh, make decisions. So um, you know, as we evolved, um, we, we realized that um, to ma make it easier to also ad adopt as that, you know, we need to streamline the deployment. So, you know, we, we are, um, um, SDAP is deployed in Kubernetes, so it can run on premise or in the private cloud. And this has all been illustrated where you know, we have SDAP deployments on premise, we have SDAP deployments in AWS. We also have SDAP deployments in um, a Red Hat OpenStack cluster. And it's everything, it's like, like other um, past presenters have already mentioned, is it's all dockerized container based deployment. So, um, and it's all the technologies behind SDAP are open source. So, if we leverage, um, you know, Solar, Elasticsearch, Cassandra, um, Spark. And so it's really driven, it, it really can integrate with many frameworks, um, different technologies that are already open. And we're not trying to reinvent um, a lot of these uh, proven technologies um, out there. Again, so um, I'm sure you've already heard this 
for over the past four days. Where the, yeah, the idea really is you know taking data, science data, and chunking them up into manifold, like smaller sizes, so that they, we can quickly retrieve um, the data based on space and time and run computation. So this is to speed up the computation so that you know things like running 20 year time series for the Gulf of Mexico can be done very, very uh, quick and parallelized. In um, here we use Spark, but you know other presenters have also mentioned things like Dask or um, there's also Ray um, for distributed and parallel computing. So in terms of um, scaling, um, we actually had a uh, project this year where you know, we deploy a, a new tool and the, on, in the first 24 hours, this was for a sea level projection tool and we reached 100K global users. So you know, we, SCAP enables um, the scaling out space on the resource utilization. So you know, when we reach this um, demand, it would scale out and you know, after the maybe the, that, that first week of um, the press and, and everyone uh, looking at the tool, we can scale resources down. So that's key in um, maintaining that the, for sort of the um, scaling on demand uh, and as needed. So we're, um, we're really, SDAP, what it really enables is a federation of um, data analysis services. Um, here, this, this picture shows the various uh, SDAP deployments that exist today. Um, there's um, SDAP deployments, uh, the sea level change portal, there's um, one for great, um, and, and there's, there's also deployments of SDAP um, in, in Europe for coverage um, and uh, the Wikio private cloud. Um, but the, the idea is that, you know, for a project like Grace, um, where, you know, they, the domain expert the, 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 uh, of the Grace data, they can serve and sort uh, an SDAP instance specifically to Grace, but that can also be used by, you know, other, um, so the researchers to hit the, the GRACE endpoint or the sea level endpoint for, for ECHO and run the analysis. So it's not necessarily that data has to be replicated in every deployment of SDAP, but through these, the programmatic access to the analysis, you know, you now scientists can hit all these various endpoints to just retrieve data that they're um, interested in studying and correlating or comparing. Um, I think here we should just see a, a plot of ECHO versus NASA measures, which is um, ECHO being a, a model data set and then the measures of being a satellite um, product, but through two, two completely separate deployments of SDAP. Um, there's also um, a, a, the, the, again, the concept of federation here for the um, NOS project. You know, there's a deployment of SDAP in the US for NASA NOAA data. And then in Germany, I think what we is the Copernicus data. And at the um, at, at JPL, we have a, a hosted Jupyter notebook, Jupyter Hub instance that we can retrieve um, both you know, data from either the US and Germany and run the analysis that way. So that you know, there is no data replication and um, or anything like that. So and that's not the focus. Um, it's, there's another example of, of a project that's a different domain, not, not oceanography, but air quality. So here um, we're pulling not just um, a satellite data, but also machine uh, data generated by models uh, as, as input and in situ data. And this image here shows you know, a, a Jupyter-based um, visualization of the of PM 2.5, which was um, the, one of the recent, you know, California wildfires. Um, and I think the next, um, in the next, what the key here is to, again, bring in all the, the data into a harmon harmonized um, framework so that it can drive decision makers or research that needs very disparate data sets, but being able to do this sort of um, on demand in, in real time. 
Um, so this is, um, a, 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 I spent some time on this slide because I think this is a very good representation of you know, we're, we're, our grand vision. Now, where do we see um, ESTA being infused and, and the, the power of ESTA? Um, so we're building this digital twin between the, um, you know, the physical world and, and the digital world. And here, you know, you can see that we can bring in data from the like STO, from USGS, from the NASA DAX, and then harmonizing it, aggregating them um, in the, in, into a, a common framework, a common system, and providing capabilities to run analysis, but analysis, um, or e and even um, a simulation and numerical models to further you know, and allow for you know, the forecast or prediction. And one of the projects that we've worked on in the past is, is um, understanding flood. Uh, so here, flood damp, um, seeing where there are spikes in you know, sort of uh, the gauges um, and retrieving satellite data that corresponds to that, that region of interest. And then um, again, with some of the information that comes out of these analysis, you now that can drive decision support or science planning. Now, when, wh where should we um, have the next measurements be be placed? Or um, and so sort of this 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 cycle that feeds back into, and then these new measurements that we measure can then feed back into the system to then um, uh, provide further analysis. So um, this was, a, a, and that grand vision is actually, we do have a recently funded effort uh, from ASTO-AST. It, it's two years to sort of um, build, you know, uh, build up this vision and integrating, um, it is a multi-agency, multi-center partnership and is also, you know, um, NASA and um, the European partners um, to, exercise this this vision and um, so we just started and really looking forward to um, what comes out of, of, of this two-year funded effort but again we really it's, it's around building out the international communities and engaging um, all of the, the partners over the years so a, a lot of the talks have already mentioned the importance of community. And so I think we, we also recognize that it's um, very important. It's not just putting our source code into GitHub, but building a community that you know, foster the open development. And Apache has, been, has, proved, has a proven record of, of doing this very well. So we're partnering with the Apache Software Foundation and um, really you know, building out the, the community through through Apache. So you know, we've actually seen collaborations from not just the NASA JPL or, or NASA as a whole, but um, by being an Apache, we have uh, contributions from eFirmer, um, from other centers as well. And you know, Apache has a governance policy in place that's been adopted by many, many projects. So the, you know, the, they have um, policies for how do you vote members in how do you people contribute back? How do people become a committer? And it's very inclusive um, and diverse uh, uh, project management com committee. Uh, so one minute now. Uh, two more slides, yay. Uh, um, in terms of uh, you know, uh, some additional information, you know, we, you know, there's been a lot of talks about ad 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 adopting standards. So we do um, adopt the OGC compliant API, you know, all the, the input data, generally are CF, ACCDD compliance. Um, and in terms of cybersecurity, you know, we're looking into currently, you know, all the authentication authorization and, and sort of role-based access, but, you know, all these APIs are currently just publicly available because the, the data is public um, by nature. Um, and, uh, and then, you know, you, you've seen sort of SDAP evolve over the past decade and, you know, as more, projects are moving into the cloud as more data formats are being um, presented. Things like SAR, um, Geo, uh, COGS, Cloud Optimized Geotiff, Parquet, that you've heard of already from past presentations. Now we're also looking into um, you know, whether we can ad um, adopt some of those and experiment with some of the more newer data formats this year. 
summer slide. So it's yep, very step uh, uh, over as we evolve has been a very new disruptive te technology that also has been adopted into many projects um, operationally. Um, and so we're really looking forward to the, the digital twin projects to give us a view of Earth, the Earth system as an integrated um, sort of system. Um, so I'll wrap up with this, this slide, thanks. And um, again, uh, Thomas is also here to answer questions. So thanks Thomas for providing a, a lot of the slides um, that he's used in, in past presentations. Thank you very much, Na. Nicely done. Uh, I think I'm uh, going to hold the questions until we, we do the, the wrap up Q&A. Uh, so I'm going to move back, uh, just moving forward now to our last presentation of the workshop. So this is from the NASA Earth Information System. Uh, and it's our honor to have Alexei Shik Lomanov is the lead of the Earth Information System Activity, the Project Scientist for Development and Evolution at NASA, NASA ESDIS and a research scientist at NASA Goddard in the Biospheric Sciences Lab. He's also the co-lead of the Visualization, Exploration, and Data Analysis, or BETA, activity. So with that, uh, take us away, Alexei. Thank you very much. Slides look good. All right, fantastic. Thank you. And it's 15 minutes, right? Yes, sir. All right, I'll try to wrap that up even faster. All right, so so thanks everyone. So so thanks for that really nice introduction. So here I am presenting the EIS perspective. I, I really do want to emphasize that it's my name on this slide deck, but I'm really just like the I signed the paychecks. This is really a large you know team of several dozen people that came together to to pull all of this off. Uh, so I'm really presenting their work here. Let's see, moving forward. So one thing I want to start with. Uh, this is going to be a little bit of a different talk uh, or a different emphasize, emphasis compared to some of the other talks. Um, this is gonna be slightly less technical and slightly more, I think, uh, hopefully inspirational about the kind of science that we can do with all of the various technical capabilities that we're pulling together here. And so one of the sort of motivating things behind the EIS uh, in the way that a lot of our work is motivated by is the decadal survey, and particularly this quote from the Decadal Survey, uh, which talks about the importance of combining information from a range of sources, uh, including all of the ones listed here, and really this idea of integrating information from multiple different kinds of approaches, uh, and leads us to insights the, uh, from the whole that are much greater than the sum of their parts. So this is something that, that we really, really took to heart as part of the EIS project. That's one of our core objectives, is realizing this vision. And so uh, the Earth Science Decadal Survey also poses, of course, a bunch of different science questions, which look something like this. For example, W5, what process determine the spatial and temporal patterns of air pollutants? Uh, how is the water cycle changing? Or how will local sea level change along coastlines or in the world in the next decade to century? And so these are great science questions, but usually when you talk to people, they're not really what people care about. They don't care about what are the spatial and temporal patterns of air pollutants. They care about what is the likelihood that my neighborhood will look something like this in the next one, one or two weeks. Uh, they might ask not about changes in the water cycle, but the likelihood of droughts uh, affecting their crops. And they might ask not about local sea level change in the abstract, but in the very concrete sense of what is the likelihood of flooding happening in my community, uh, and particularly on my neighborhood and affecting my business or my home. And so the, the, we, to this end, we had three Earth Information System pilot studies. This, these took place, I want to emphasize, over six months Okay, so this is not a two year or three year or five year project. This is a six month project starting from basically zero that took place in 2021. And we had three pilot studies, one on fires uh, with this tagline here of harnessing unique data and models to understand the impacts of new extreme fires in the earth system. A project on freshwater uh, about integrating data and models across the full water cycle to deliver actionable freshwater information. And one project on sea level change on advancing understanding of sea level change by breaking barriers to collaboration and connecting process models to observations. And really across all three of these projects, there are these three common themes that I wanna highlight. First, that they are tackling complicated earth science decadal survey questions uh, that require synthesizing both models and observations from NASA and its partners. Uh, They're all about facilitating interdisciplinary scientific collaboration and stakeholder engagement. It's both really important components. Uh, leveraging both open source tools, but also emerging computing capabilities along the lines of many of the things that you've heard about uh, over the last four days. And finally, translating scientific results into actionable information. Uh, so not just about producing graphs uh, of the kind that we scientists are used to interpreting, but actually translating those into information people can use and understand. 
So I want to just really quickly show a few of the highlights of some of the kinds of things that we did. Um, so on the EIS fire pilot, uh, the problem that we tackled is that you have to go to like 10 different places to get uh, a comprehensive picture about fires at NASA right now, um, just because of the nature of the way those data are organized. And so we sort of combined all those data in a single location and did some cool things with them as a result. Uh, so here you're seeing a little dashboard that's showing you the ability to track individual fires, uh, including their fire perimeters. Uh, and their total fire burned area automatically uh, from just a uh, few years active fire data, which of course comes in as pixels. Uh, also sort of combining that information with information about fire weather coming from multiple different sources here, two different products stored in two different locations to understand why that fire might be happening. And also really characterizing the fire using a bunch of observations, not just from NASA notice, but also from NOAA here in the form of the GOES satellite. Um, on the sea level pilot, uh, this is a really nice example uh, here showing you about sort of one of the taglines of the sea level project was from the Greenland ice sheet to my backyard and really was able to realize this. So, so on the left here, you can see a little graphical user interface showcasing uh, a wrapper around a process based fern model. Fern is basically a, a very compacted kind of snow with apologies to all these snow scientists out there for that simplistic explanation. Um, we they implemented a couple of these kind of process models in our cloud environment, uh, and then ultimately took information like this, combining with information about vertical land motion, to produce these nice stories that look something like this. For example, here you can see at the neighborhood or even block level uh, the, the sea level change risk um, from from sea level change. And finally, freshwater. Freshwater did a bunch of really cool things. Uh, this is one really nice example uh, where they integrated data and models across the full water cycle to deliver actionable freshwater information. What does that look like? Uh, well, this is analyzing a, a record flooding event that happened in 2019, and it really just shows the importance of, of looking at this event holistically, right? Synthesizing information from GPM, precipitation mission, SMAP, a soil moisture passive radar mission, GRACE FO, a, uh, a weird mission, right? But that one that, that gives you really cool information on gravity, uh, AMSR2, another radar mission, and MODIS, um, which is a bunch of different instruments. Uh, an important component of this was the open science environment. This again, science branch cloud environment, which I'll we'll get to in a second, which enabled rapid prototyping of these models. Uh, including this land information system or LIS, which was something that was really, really important. Uh, and also enabled actually some new analyses of water quality with the land information system, which is traditionally only focused on water uh, quantity. And uh, finally, just being able to stitch all of this together into a compelling narrative uh, in a single location. Again, it's the kind of thing that EIS is trying to enable. So, so getting back to, to the template that, that Sarah sent me here, um, the key driving requirements here were really analysis ready access to many different NASA and then NASA data products, um, including a large variety. So not just gridded satellite observations, but also model products as well as airborne and ground-based data. Uh, the ability to run actual computation intensive physically based models in this environment. Uh, also the ability to um, this interactive development and collaboration environment, uh, which allowed us to do analysis in place on all these data that were co-located. And importantly, an, an environment like that to which it is easy to add new users from within and outside of NASA. Um, also the availability of publicly accessible interfaces and APIs. Um, the customers and stakeholders here are, are quite varied. Uh, so we include both experts, uh, so scientists, for who it is, this makes it easier to do research and develop new products. Uh, some of our stakeholders are operational agencies and decision makers uh, who also want to make more use of NASA models, data, and expertise in their various workflows and in the supporting their decisions. Uh, and the general public, really just making uh, NASA science activities more accessible to the public. Uh, and so what are some of the factors to constrain our solution? Um, a big one is the fragmentation of NASA's earth science capabilities. Uh, just the fact that we heard like 20 presentations over the last four days sort of shows you the wide variety of things that are out there. Uh, not to mention the fact that data sets are also distributed across a wide range of DACs. Um, NASA IT security policies are something we were able to mitigate, but it's still sort of there that's hovering. I'd argue even more importantly, NASA's copyright and intellectual property rules. Um, this is something that significantly hampered our ability to release code open source. In fact, the fact that we released code open source was sort of by breaking those rules and just releasing it anyway, without waiting for the you know, 18 month software release process. Uh, and finally, this competitive small project funding model. Uh, this is not the funding kind of funding that supported this activity, and that's exactly why this activity is able to work, right? You cannot do this kind of thing in a ROSES project, especially in six months, but you can do it with sort of large directed investment. And this is something that's really, really important to note. 
Okay, so, so system architecture, I'm going to fly through this um, at a very, very high level. We took a bunch of data uh, that's output from Earth system models, from satellites, from ground-based sensors. We threw it all together into uh, Amazon's S3 storage on our science managed cloud environment in a common cloud optimized format, typically ZAR. Uh, that let us do all kinds of cool stuff with it inside of Jupyter Notebooks. Um, we also had, uh, uh, the fact that we were able to do stuff in those Jupyter Notebooks quickly is thanks to a lot of the hard work that was done by the Pangeo team uh, on developing all of these fantastic tools that work really, really well together. Um, and also thanks to the availability of flexible on-demand compute in the cloud. Uh, we also had uh, a couple prototype interactive dashboards and also sort of through a connection to Esri, we're able to generate these nice story maps coming out of this. So a little bit more detailed look. Um, uh, this looks almost identical to a lot of the other things that you've seen over the last four days, so I'm not going to go through it uh, uh, carefully. I think the most important thing to highlight here is that all of this sits inside the Science Managed Cloud environment. Um, this is one of the Managed Cloud environments, one of the three that NASA has, um, similarly to the uh, Mission Cloud Platform, uh, which I think is where MAP is running. Um, so this is NASA's lowest security entry point to AWS. Um, it's, it's not meant for operational use, and that makes it really, really fantastic for rapid deployment and for external collaboration because of that low security posture. Um, uh, we use the modular design. We're using open source components whenever possible. Um, you'll notice a lot of these things are not things that we invented, right? They're just things that, that the open source community has already created. Uh, and finally, a really important piece of all this is the infrastructure as code idea. The fact that all of this is organized within a handful of configuration files that makes it really easy to modify and also to redeploy many, many times. In fact, the EIS project comprised three different stacks, one for each of these groups. And then there are at least like half a dozen stacks inspired by EIS that are now floating around at Goddard. Um, and the fact that we can deploy those really quickly is because of this infrastructure as code idea. So a couple more questions here from Sarah. Does the project reuse legacy software? Yes. Uh, a lot of the simulation models we use are these large behemoths written in Fortran or C. They don't lend themselves well to being run out of notebooks, right? Does the project use open source software? Yes. I talked about this a lot, Pangeo, thank God, and also open source geospatial tools uh, from, from the Pangeo community and elsewhere. Um, software development open collaborative environment. Uh, yes, uh, mostly again, because we were flaunting uh, flagrantly just NASA's open source software release rules, uh, the shared Jupyter Notebooks version controlled by self-hosted GitLab. Uh, and also this, again, this, the low security posture gave us a straightforward process for granting new users access. Uh, cybersecurity, again, if we assume everything is FISMA low, that makes things a little bit easier, that lets us use SMCE. Uh, and as a result, we controlled access through AWS Cognito. Uh, this was literally me as a scientist giving people access, so this is very, very easy. And cluster access, um, we had a, a cluster there as well. Those access to that was through SSH keys. Um, and the process for even granting actually some limited form of AWS console access was also relatively straightforward. And this was really useful. Uh, the fact that I as a scientist could sort of go in there and sometimes turn things off when they weren't collaborating or other things like that was actually really, really useful. Uh, moving on, some more questions here. What compute environments? Again, the science managed cloud environment was a really important piece of this. Uh, how the project ensured system efficiency. Um, basically, by having an amazing team, I think this is something that we shouldn't forget that system administration teams are incredibly important and not all not, are not always cheap. Um, but they sort of pay themselves off uh, by monitoring our costs and other things like that. We also made aggressive use of EC2 spot instances. This is a great way to keep your costs down if you have a project that does not have a really strong operational mandate, which this one did not, uh, where you can experiment on things. EC2 spot instances can save you a lot of money. How do we deploy our operating and operate our system? Again, the SMC system administration team, I really cannot say enough good words about them. They were fantastic. Um, this is an essential component and it is not usually free. Uh, so somebody has to pay for it somewhere, right? And so this is something that we should always keep in mind. Um, and finally, again, I talked about infrastructure as code as being important. So open source community collaboration. Uh, I, what does Open Science Media Project? I'm going to echo a language I've heard used in Kevin Murphy's presentations on this, uh, where sort of open is defined in terms of transparency, inclusivity, reproducibility, accessibility. We tried our best to hit all four of these. I'm not going to speak to them, but you can read them on the slide here. Um, I think the accessibility piece is particularly important in sort of the, the target of this activity, right? Which is like, it you just sort of releasing data, it does not make it accessible, right? Accessibility, I think, needs to be interpreted more broadly in terms of can people understand it and sort of make decisions based on those observations. And that requires not just cyber infrastructure, but also science uh, and communications expertise as well. 
Um, barriers that our project faced, uh, we had a short timeline, like I mentioned, six months for everything that I described above, uh, with frequent monthly demos that we gave to headquarters, and also the NASA software release process is terrible. I cannot say enough about how terrible it is. All right, and how our project enabled community collaboration, uh, we invited people to use our stuff, that was good, um, but we did not contribute to other NASA projects or external open source communities, that was bad. So I think that's something that we can improve on and something that we need to work on. So really quickly, what's next for EIS is this beta activity. You might hear this sort of floating around the, uh, the NASA internet uh, over the next coming weeks to months. Um, basically, EIS started out as a joint sort of science and cyber infrastructure activity. And now moving forward, we have divided it where the cyber infrastructure is now going to be developed in a centralized fashion, organized through ESDS, that's NASA's data systems. And it's going to look something vaguely like this, sort of everything oriented around this analysis ready cloud optimized store. Um, but you can see some other pieces of various things that you may have heard about here. So MAP, for instance, George's great presentation earlier sits up here in the top left corner. Uh, and then we've got uh, use cases here and um, also lots of various capabilities from NASA that already exist sitting here on the output. And this is my last slide, lessons learned. Um, how do you do science quickly? Well, you put all of the data in the same place in the same format. That makes it a lot easier to work with. Note that though that there are no silver bullets for analysis ready storage. If you want to draw maps or if you want to draw time series, you need to organize your data differently. One is going to be good for one, one is going to be good for the other. You need to think about that carefully. Uh, don't reinvent the wheel. We've heard about this a lot. I just want to reiterate it. Take advantage of all the fantastic work that people have done before you. Stand on the shoulders of giants when you can. Uh, use a versatile system that is allowed to fail fast and has low security requirements. This is important to doing something quickly. It is not necessarily important to doing something well. Uh, so there is going to be a trade-off there between doing something quickly and doing something well. Uh, finally, invest, or investing in software development system and institution support, very, very important. We're pulling these kinds of projects off, not something that we as scientists often do. Um, engage to users and stakeholders early and often. Uh, this is basically a co-development model works extremely well for these kinds of projects. Um, and finally, I, I, this is a really, really important point that I want to highlight about the spirit of EIS is that uh, stakeholders often don't want our products. They want information, solutions, and answers, right? So if you give people access to like five different soil moisture products and 10 different GPP products, they're not going to know what to do with them, right? They often want to know the answer to the question, what does NASA think about X? And so I would encourage us all as we were designing the ESO, uh, architecture as we're designing sort of the future of NASA data science to move beyond these mis this mission specific thinking, sort of holistic thinking about the earth system and how we can really sort of study it comprehensively. So that's all I got. I'm sorry I ran, I think, 57 seconds over here, but uh, thank you everyone for your time. I'm looking forward to the discussion. Thank you, Alexei. Uh, great, great presentation and some nice takeaways. All right, so uh, before we turn it over to the Q&A part, I believe I'd like to invite uh, Andy Bingham to come on, and I think he's going to uh, request we all Hi. participate here. There we yeah. go, Andy. Take it away. Thank you. Um, so uh, before we go into the Q&A, we just thought it'd be great to have a, a group photo. Um, I think we've still got over 80 people here. Um, so Susan from ESIP has offered to try and facilitate this for us. So uh, if you just all could turn on your videos. Susan, over to you. Sure, if everyone would turn on their videos for a minute and uh, we won't all fit on one screen at one time. So I'm gonna have to do a couple. Um, so just, you know, smile, look nice. <laughs> I suppose I should turn on my camera as well. Hold on a second. Appreciate your patience. There is one. Don't leave yet. <laughs> oh, there's four. Wow, that's awesome. I don't do small for. <laughs> well, I'm we're number to, two. Sorry about that. Do we get to pick who we sit next to? Yeah. Sadly, no. <laughs> Everybody, point to Andy. <laughs> You're on my big screen here, Andy. Okay, 
I feel like we should be playing the Brady Bunch theme song. (laughs) (laughs) Only people old enough to know that. Okay, you're free. Thank you, <laughs> sorry, Susan. Sorry about that. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So um, to the fishbowl. Don't everybody leave. <laughs> yeah. All right, back to Natasha. And Elias. Thanks. Thanks, Andy. Um, so I'm gonna we're gonna make this quick. Um, we have we're gonna do one question per speaker, um, and then we'll wrap up with just a little bit about what's what we're going to do with all this information that all of you have been so generous to provide us over the last several days um, and how we're going to organize all that. So um, to start, um, I, I'm going to ask um, Laura, are you, I see you are on. Um, so for yeah. Laura, what do cost models look like for services, both from the perspective of what the user sees when selecting a service and from the perspective of how the project calculates or determines these costs? That is an excellent question. (laughs) And even Um, if you've just thought about it, it would be great to just, you've probably thought about it more than we have, so. Yeah, it's certainly, it's it's something that's gonna be really critical to figure out properly to really make a, a managed service approach work. And I think one of the purposes of um, sort of unity and early development is actually figure out how to develop that cost model, right? So for us, it's a little early to to have a good answer to you, Um, but I think it's become really clear that that's absolutely critical um, to get right. Uh, I don't know if Hook wants to add anything. I think uh, one, turn on my video. Um, One thing that we did talk about in our team with respect to this was, um, you know, one of the key things for us is to, collect metrics, collect usage, uh, look at cost models from the underlying infrastructure and try to correlate. Are there ways that we could uh, you know, track each user's usage and correlate the, the billing and accounting for it? Um, other things that we talked about previously in our project was um, you know, part of related to deployment, uh, certain areas of the overall system are deployed per tenant and other areas are shared. For the per tenant aspects, it's, it's a little bit more trivial, I guess, relatively speaking, to uh, you know, correlate those costs. But for their shared components, it's uh, things that we need to look into in terms of this, is this like a, is this an overhead? Is this a tax? Is this, I mean, what, there, there's, uh, there's so many different ways we can divide this up. Hmm. Great, thanks. Um, so this one's for Na. So SDAP takes DAC data and makes them analysis ready. Um, what are the challenges with doing that? And from your perspective, could DAX provide this? And if so, why haven't they? I don't know if I can answer that. Why haven't they? Um, but so, so, so I, I think you'll see a um, gradual shift because uh, I also work at, at Podak where um, you know, to provide the analysis ready data that, that, that sort of uh, there's an sort of a an archived format, whether that's MSDF or HDF, and then the more um, analysis optimized data. So that could be something like SAR or the next new format. But um, you know, when that day comes, and I'm sure you know, the, our SDAP again is, is a framework. So we're actually looking at we have projects looking at you know utilizing data at DAX or, or at, um, at other projects that have already converted the, the, the science data into something like SAR um, versus ingesting that entire um, you know, data series from the native format into something like SDAP as analysis ready. Mm-hmm. Great. I don't know if Thomas wants, do you want to add anything, Thomas? Nope. All right. Oh, he's, he's talking, he's on mute. Um. I don't know if he has talking permissions, but we, we can't hear you, Thomas. So I'm gonna move on. And if you happen to get it, just wave at me and I'll know when you've got it, the sound on. Um, for the sake of time, I'm gonna move on. So for Alexi, how does your system allow access to new users, including non-NASA users, when it is the NASA M- SMCE? And, and how does that cost it? You mentioned that SMCE had low risk, 
I think you said FISMA um, for rapid deployment, but would this limit scalability and ability to work for missions with long time horizons and lots of users? All right, so, so there's there's like three questions in there. So I'll try to track them each in turn. So, so how did we grant people access? Um, basically, we just have an extremely open open model for this, right? So, so like we did everything through AWS Cognito. I had full authority to add anybody that I wanted to it. So all I needed was a name, a phone number, and an email address. I add them and then they're in the Jupyter Lab that lets them do everything Jupyter Lab that our Jupyter Lab lets them do. Um, that was really, really useful because it meant that I could onboard people within like, you know, minutes of receiving their, their information and they could be in our system right away. Fantastic for demos, fantastic for stakeholders, really, really great. Um, that's not really a, a sustainable security model, obviously, which is why the whole system is, is not meant to be designed for missions. I think it's, it's less actually because of the reliability and, and more because of the, uh, because of the security. There's nothing about SMC that means you can't do things in there reliably. Um, it's just that sort of the, the whole philosophy behind it, not even so much the cyber infrastructure, but the philosophy is it's in, designed around like small science projects being allowed to quickly spin up something in the cloud, quickly try something. And then eventually the idea would be that like operational level capabilities would be handed off to something that is more operational with higher security requirements, but also higher operational mandates. And I think there was a third part to that question. I think it was just, yeah, like, I think you actually answered it. So it was kind of oh, cost. Yeah, cost. That was the, that was the yes. other one. Yeah. Yeah. So cost. So we, so we had, we had a compute budget that we received from our benefactors at headquarters. Um, and then like everybody that was added onto the project, just like did dug into that compute budget. Our compute usage was actually relatively low because the project was short. And by the time people could actually start computing, it was like most of the way into the project. So we, we didn't end up actually using a lot of the compute project budget that we requested. The nice thing about AWS is that you don't lose that money, right? You still have it. Um, but uh, yeah, again, that's an unsustainable cost model uh, because yeah, you can't just add whoever you want, right? At any time onto your project and you pay for the compute costs. So that is, all of that is basically part of the justification for why the original EIS pilot studies, we sort of did our own thing and it was successful. We did some cool science with it. Now, as we want to scale this up to more users, more stakeholders and the more operational capability, we are moving onto a more enterprise grade solution, which is going to be this Vita system, which uses in turn components that are much more mature, things like map, uh, more sort of mature visualization capabilities and all of the really fancy, really nice stuff that, that George talked about in his presentation and you've heard about from others as well. Okay, great. Um, I. I, for the sake of time, I'm, I'm keeping it to one question per um, speaker, but Thomas, did you want to answer in particular, maybe you have an answer for why, why DAC? Can you hear me? Yes, we can. <laughs> Turn on the big headphone, right? 30 hours. <laughs> um, so analysis ready data. Um, so the, if you look at the timeline, SDAP, uh, actually introduced the idea about tiling uh, in 2014. This is way before uh, ZAR or any of this um, uh, solution, but we really introduced the idea how we partition data and parallelize the computations. Uh, the, the, the archive center, uh, I think they are, uh, and I don't wanna speak for them, but I do feel that they do want to support analysis ready data, but they also have to support the original, uh, preserve the data as the original format. So there's a duplication effort that needs to be done. There's a cost driver right, as well. Uh, I think it's exciting to see the community is looking at ZAR and, and COTS and, and Paquet uh, as some of these uh, uh, more converging into standards. We do see that hopefully one day that we'll see that uh, this, they become the long-term archive format for on the cloud environment instead of uh, uh, having to use the, uh, the monolithic file solution. So, but again, like Nas said, the, the SDAP solution is, uh, is really neutral. That's the, the user access the system to API. So you not you don't have to take an Amazon class uh, just to use, you no, know, like you didn't take Amazon class to sign up for Google, right? Gmail, right? So we don't want to have to do that, right? So that's the whole point. And can, I don't know if you can speak to this, but have there been limits in this approach with like why it hasn't sort of been broadly adopted by DAX? Well, I think this requires a lot more validations. Uh, I mean, you know, I work with scientists a lot, and some of the scientists when we choose something like uh, tiling the data, uh, their first uh, concern is that like uh, don't mess with my data. 
<laughs> so, uh, so we really have to go do lengthy validation with them, comparing the original source of data with the computed output uh, to do some convincing, right? Uh, I think just require a little more convincing. And again, ARD is a generic term, uh, like some, one of the speakers says, it really depends on the kind of analysis you're doing. Um, and uh, I think we overloaded uh, that terminology quite a bit. Uh, but the whole goal is to be able to parallelize the, uh, the com computation, make the data easy to work with in a scalable environment. Great, thank you so much. Um, I wanna thank all of our speakers and I apologize for making it short. It's the end of four days and I think everyone's pretty tired. So um, I, I wanted to end with sharing with all of you um, what we're gonna do with all this information. Um, hold on a second. You're probably now seeing, are you seeing the SAWG next steps? Yeah. Okay, great. So, uh, so what we're going to do is, um, we're going to break down a uh, mission data processing system architecture into its parts. The way that I've been describing this to people is think about buying an Ikea desk. You pull out the parts list and there's screws and there's legs and there's wood pieces and you lay them all out and you say, okay, a desk has all these parts, right? So a mission data processing system has some parts and we're going to look across all of these different architectures to synthesize what those commonalities are and define what the parts are, as well as maybe some parts that were identified through the conversations. And then we're going to build different architecture variants. So that's really thinking holistically about how those parts work together based on what we learned about operations, portability, interfaces with NASA, implementation and deployment strategies, and ways to integrate community contributions and analysis platforms. So this is the importance of that survey you've seen a, sort of floating around in the chat multiple times. And don't worry, you're going to get to see that link one more time, and we'll send it out after this workshop. Um, and then we will conduct a trade study of those architectures um, for meeting the evaluation criteria that were identified from workshop one. And those eval criteria trace to the objectives that we were given for a mission data processing system that must meet ESO mission needs. It must enable data system efficiencies. It must support earth system science and applications, and it must promote open science, open source science. So ultimately, the SAWG will deliver by, you know, September 2022. Um, we will develop, um, deliver some candidate architectures that we will qualitatively evaluate across all of those eval criteria. Um, and it will not be the SAWG's job to decide an architecture going forward. That is the job of NASA. So we will merely provide them the analysis from all of this um, and they can determine the viability of those architectures programmatically. So considering costs, logistics, policies, strategy, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Our timeline looks a little bit like this. We are hoping to get you all a report of our synthesis from this workshop by mid-April. Um, mid-April through June, we'll start building out different architecture variants. Um, and June through mid-July, we'll conduct our trade study um, and we'll put together a report in July through August. And by September, we're hoping to have workshop three for which we hope that all of you will attend or at least be interested in the outcomes. Um, and so with that, we'd like to invite you to stay engaged with us. Um, I promised you this link. Uh, again, you can screenshot this um, and we will send this link out to you as well as a follow-up for this workshop, um, but you can help us open the door make sure that we are really not limited by our own imaginations and experience by taking the survey. We've gotten a lot of great inputs from all of our speakers and we'll be looking at those, those slides, the conversations, we've taken detailed notes. Um, but of course, if you felt like you had something to say and it didn't get said um, because this is a virtual environment, it's very hard, um, this survey is a great place to go. Um, of course, we welcome you to please register for workshop three when that comes out. Um, we have workshop one is already posted online. Um, and for the workshop two, we will email that out to you when it's available. And we will post it on our website that you all have access to um, with a registered DOI. And if in the meantime, 
this is not enough engagement and you have a, an itch to scratch and you want to talk with either Elias or I, we are available and you can email us. So I think that's it. And I just want to say thank you and I'll hand it over to our steering committee. Thank you, Natasha. Um, so I have the privilege of kind of closing this out. Um, first, I just want to say thank you to all the speakers for the excellent talks. Um, kudos to all of you for the openness to your willingness to share everything um, and your collaboration um, you know, for now and, and in the future as well. Um, I just want to thank everybody here on the uh, in the audience. We had 300 people, 350 people register throughout this week and have attended at some point. So uh, thank you. Um, thank you for the con your contributing your of um, your ideas. Um, and uh, please keep sending them, sending them to the working group. Um, and you can also send uh, uh, send anything you might have to the steering committee as well. And um, you can find us on the uh, on our website. Um, I want to thank our steering committee um, for the great work that's been happened before behind the scenes, and particularly to Sarah Lubkin and Karen Yuen, um, Yuen of, of JPL and, and NASA of Goddard. Um, you've done a lot of work in the background to make this a successful workshop, so thank you. Uh, for, I'd like to thank the ESIP team um, for providing the uh, infrastructure here to have a successful workshop and all the great ideas that you provided as well. And finally, um, to the people who have done most of the work, <laughs> uh, there's a working group. Um, you guys are just amazing, awesome, fantastic. Uh, Natasha, Elias, um, you have represented your, the team incredibly well. I um, really do appreciate it. And, uh, um, and certainly going to appreciate all the hard work you're going to be doing now over the next uh, the course of the next few, few months to get us to uh, workshop number three, um, as, as uh, Natasha pointed out, will be in the August, September, September timeframe. So I hope you can all come and join us at that meeting too. Um, so with that, um, please give yourselves all a big round of applause. Um, incredible four days, and I, and it really was a marathon. But we got there to the, we got there at the end. So thank you for coming over the uh, the final line with us. And with that, bang, I close out this meeting. Oh, sorry, unless Andy Mitchell, do you got anything you want to say? And I apologize. No, I think you covered everything. Uh, great job, everyone. Uh, you summed up everything. Thank Perfect. you. Thank you all. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. Thank you, Luke. Bye bye. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Shell. Thank you, Shell.